Welcome to my course! Before we dive into our first lecture, I want to talk about the editor I'm going to use, Microsoft Visual Studio Code. The editor is available for Windows and Mac OS, and I'm going to use it the whole course. To follow me during the lectures, it is important to memorize some shortcuts. Let me now open for the first time Visual Studio Code and show you the interface we will use and what commands you should know in order to follow the lectures. So this is the surface of Visual Studio Code. When you open the first time, you will have this welcome page. You can just close this, we don't need this one. Now, you see already you have here show all commands and this is actually the important thing. If you hit now this commands like shift, command and P, in Windows, it should be Shift, SDRG, and uh, P. And now you see here all the available commands. You see, if you open here, like Help, Markdown, your window, for example, and Preferences. This here is something, uh, shortcuts for uh, add on I installed you won't have that one here of course um then do you have to see all other stuff you select new next and quick open and so on clear the terminal commands of course too because it has actually an integrated terminal i'm going to show you how to open that then and also some view uh, some other stuff okay we don't we won't need anything uh like everything here we just need some specific commands or you don't even need them some of them really some of them you can just use by clicking or whatever so first of all let's open a new folder this is the first thing we do we open a folder we uh, give it a, a project folder something like that i have now here a project folder already prepared so i'm going to open this and there are already a lot of folders uh, because actually I recorded this video after I recorded all the other videos but don't be too uh, wor don't worry I mean this is just this is just folders here under uh, subfolders where our projects are later will be so if you want to create a new folder for example in each lesson I will work in a specific folder in the next lesson or the first next lesson will be for example uh cc css box model and what is that box model so this folder will be that one and here you have some subfolders what is the box model will be the index here it will be within that and the second one the content of the box will be in this folder and so on so you just create a new folder which you do by clicking on this icon here now it creates, of course, a folder within the box model folder. You just break that up. If you want to uh, create a folder in the root dictionary, you just click here and then you create a folder. And then you give the folder name, okay, hit enter, and then the folder is created. If you want to delete this, right click and click on delete. Pop your trash. So this is actually how it works. This is how you create a new file. So if you want to create a file in a new folder, you just give it a name and don't forget to add the ending. If you, for example, create an index.html, then also add the ending HTML, otherwise it won't work. All right, so I'm going to delete this here. All right, okay. This is uh, actually how it works. Now I'm going to show you some specific commands I'm going to use on an example file. So I just uh, create here a new file quickly. Example, let's call it HTML because with the ending actually it recognizes some stuff because Visual Studio Code has already a plugin installed. It's called Emmet. And you can do something really cool here. If we create some HTML structures and elements, we don't have to type everything out. What we actually do is writing the keyword like the HTML tag, you know, the HTML document actually starts with it. I mean, actually it starts with the doc type information, but in this, during this course, I will just start everything with the HTML tag. We don't 
these you can use anything else it's just examples so i have now html and then i hit enter and this is all you have to do you can actually build a whole structure just with emmet and keywords just go back return my action with command and z and now what i'm doing is html then you use this here create a then sign and because actually you nest something in this html structure and what we are going to nest in the html structure is definitely a head tag because this is the basic structure of html and a body tag and then we hit this and see we have already the basic structure of our html document so let's just let's sort this a little bit and yeah this is how you do it now we for example add here this will always be the simply based structure by the way the title the meta tag and a style tag i will use during the course just inline css i won't use any external css file because this is just easier and it's not that much HD, uh, css actually you will write here so hit enter give it a title yeah, the meta, I don't know, some char set I'm going to use, UTF-8 during the course, and then some styles and so on here. And then you, for example, you can also make kind of mathematical commands here. You can use multiply, plus, and so on. So, I mean, you saw, saw that already. If I create something like, I want to create a div tag and a p tag, and h1 tag then i'm going to do this like this but you also can do something like i want to create unordered list you know with an unordered list there's usually a list element nested i want five list elements so i just write actually list times five so li times five which will create five list elements and now i want to nest an anchor tag for example and then you have always this already the structure for unordered list for navigation or something else now let's delete this and something else i'm going to do often probably is something like that uh yeah let's actually create this again like let's make five and then an eight i will do something like this for example when if something is wrong pl placed here in the wrong position i'm going to select this line by clicking command and i this is the first line the second line the third line this line and if i want to move this whole block away i just click alt and then the arrow for error keys you see i can just move it where i want in this case of course it's right so we just leave it here so this is how actually what i will mostly use here something else i'm going to use jumping of course to the end of the line you just do it by command and arrow keys so back and forth on the end of the line and on the beginning of the line or if you just make big jumps you just click alt and then the arrow keys you see it makes bigger jumps so you don't have to do every single step here and something else i'm going to use is multi-line selection this you can do for example by clicking alt command and then arrow key down so now I selected all these lines here. And now we can add something. I don't know. Yeah. You see like that. Uh, this is pretty handy, for example. So this is actually all I'm going to use mostly. Uh, the rest is not that important. You can, of course, look up if there's something else which is kind of interesting for you. So remember always Shift, Command, and P to see all your commands and what you can do for shortcuts and vendor specific is is pretty similar actually to mac os so you won't be that much difference so i hope to see you in the next episode where i talk a little bit of the, about the operating system and other specific elements i'm going to use because i'm going to use mac os during the course but it shouldn't be a problem for windows users as well so i'm going to see you in the next episode now we talk about specific things I'm going to use and it there's no difference between 
on the versions I'm using on macOS only because I'm going to use the browser Safari to open our files. But it is actually the same on Windows, you're just going to use the Google Chrome browser. And I wanted to show you the terminal at the beginning because in the previous episode I said I will show you there's integrated terminal. So here you see the shortcut or you just click on actually view and integrated terminal. And then there's this terminal. So here's the terminal. You can list your file, uh, like your, your, your folder content, and you can also create a new folder and so on. Yeah, and, and so on. But we are not going to use actually the terminal because we are not going to code in JavaScript. We only make CSS here. So it's not really necessary at all. What is actually kind of important is that I'm going to show you how to open your file, your HTML file, and you're going to do that by clicking on your HTML file, right click, copy the path, or using this shortcut here. And then you're going to use the browser, open the browser, and you're going to copy this in. And then just hit enter and the file opens in your browser as HTML file, of course. Uh, I have kind of a little problem always. You see here, this doesn't work really. And I always have to add this file double point slash 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 and then get actually the path. Otherwise it won't work. But as I meant before, if you open Chrome browser, it's the same procedure. So you open the Chrome browser, paste in your address and hit enter and it automatically opens actually the file. So you see there's no real difference between Windows and macOS I'm going to use. It's both the same. The only thing is the commands and the shortcuts. But as I said in the previous episode, you just click shift, command and P and you see all the commands. I hope that will help you. If there's any question open, please don't hesitate to message me or create a question in Udemy so someone else will help you. If you ask me personally, I will try always to answer in time, so that means within a day. It will be not always possible because I work full time next to that here, so, but most of the time I will answer within a day. And I hope you will have now fun. We will create now our step now into our first section and our first code we will write. First of all, welcome to my course. And we will start now with the CSS box model. Before we start right away writing some code, we want to clear what is the CSS box model and what do we define as box? Well, if we create an HTML element, the browser draws a box around the content added in our HTML elements. Let me show you that. If I'm going to create here some basic tags like a p tag with some lorem ipsum fill text or a h1 tag with some nonsense te text and then additional let's create uh, another list and some list elements and open this in our browser then we have all these elements here and each element appears on one line. They stack on top of each other. Well, these are all boxes. So the browser draws a box around this element, for example. The browser also draws a box around this H1 tag here or this unordered list. If we now just do simply 
uh, add a border to all these elements. So first of all, let's add a border to the P tag, to the H1 tag, and to the unordered list. Let's make one pixel, solid, and let's give it a fire brick. And then reload the browser. Then we see the boxes. Now, additionally with the box, there are four separate edges. There are the content edge, the border edge, the padding edge, and the margin edge. Is there no CSS property applied to our HTML element, then all the edges of the HTML elements will be the same. But our browser automatically adds some styling, such as margin or padding. We can see that in our browser here. This space between the very top of our window here, our document, and the very left of our document and our HTML elements, this is some margin defined by the browser. If I'm going to reset this now by selecting the body, and setting the, setting the margin to zero and reload our browser, then you see that disappears the space. And our HTML elements right away are on the document borders here. If our box doesn't have any width or height set, then the box is set just around the content. We can change the width and height to a specific value or even a minimum or maximum width or height. So let me add width and height to our P element here, our paragraph. Let's say width 400 pixels. And let's open this in the browser. Now you see our element has a width of 400 pixels, so it doesn't have the whole width anymore of our browser. It still is a block level element though, so it still takes up for the whole full width of the document, but we will come to that later. Now, I talked about these four separate edges, the content edge, the border edge, the padding edge, and the margin edge. We we'll start now with the padding edge. And if you want to add space between the content edge and the padding edge, you just set simply the padding property. If not specified, the padding will be added on the top, right, bottom, and left. This affects the actual size of the element. I'm going to show you that by adding a padding to our paragraph. I'm adding a padding of 25 pixels. I'm going to reload this in the browser. And you see, there is now 25 pixel space between our content edge and our padding edge. This padding size is of course added to our content width, to the whole width of our box. So if we have now 400 pixels width of our paragraph of our box, we have now to add on each side left and right 25 pixels. So the total width of our element is now 450 pixels. If we want to get rid of this behavior, we can use box sizing. and then border box as value. I'm going to reload now the browser and you see it disappears. So it actually shrinks the content because it takes now the padding from the inside without giving the add and JL element additional width. You can set the padding 
separately for each side by writing it like this here padding now you give it the top size the right the bottom and the left so let's do this by giving padding 50 pixels from the top from the right we want 20 pixels from the bottom I'm adding just 5 pixels and from the left we say 100 pixels and I'm going to delete this here open this in the browser and reload now you see it applied to our HTML element so we have different paddings now from the left the top the bottom and the right to set all sides with the same padding size you just use the simple short form like we used before just one value now all the same padding sizes are added to the left right and top and bottom and if you don't want to add padding edge sizes to the actual size of the element then you can avoid that by setting box sizing to border box and you can set additionally a border we talked about the edges so i also mentioned the border edge and the border edge is between the padding edge and the margin edge the border edge works simply the same way you set border like we did here actually and it got added to to the actual element but because we have box sizing it doesn't add so if we just do that now for our h1 element give it a border of 10 pixels solid green and reload our browser then it will be added to the actual width if we set a width of course so let's add a width 200 pixels now our element doesn't have the width of 200 pixel it has the width of 220 pixels because we have to add again the border to the left side and the border to the right side and if you want the total height you have to add it to the top and bottom as well if you set a height you can set the border to any size and color you want you have the following options as border style you can add the border style separately by saying border style or you just simply use the form i already used the whole time here first the width then the border style and then the color we have the option dotted let's open this and you see we have a dotted border you also can say you want a double and you have now a double border or you can add a dashed border you see how that looks now and now we can also add a inset border this is how that looks and outset and this is what that looks like margin on the other hand will be set on the outer edge of our box so it pushes our box away from other content for margin are the same rules as for padding you can set each side individually and you can write it in the same form let's do that with our ul element writing a margin again top we want let's say 200 pixels then from the right i want 
50 pixels. From the bottom, I want 5 pixels. From the left, I want, let's say, 300 pixels. Some we won't see because we actually don't have element on the bottom. And now just reload and you see it pushes our element away from the left and the top. From the bottom, not really because there is no element where we can push from. If we apply the same to our paragraph, let's do that. We can use again the short version, like just for all sides, for all sides. Let's make margin 25 pixels and reload. Then it gives 25 pixels from the top and left. And if there would be an element to the right, then two and from the bottom two. But what you can actually do with margin is comparing to padding, you can give it a negative value to move the box relative to its position. So you can set, for example, or h1 margin, let's use the left minus 20 pixels. And you see, it kind of moves the box to the left and a part of that disappears. This is, of course, all the other version, how you can write it. You don't have to write it in the longhand version with margin. You can use margin left, top, bottom, and right to get the same effect. Welcome to our second episode and our second lesson. In the previous lesson, we talked about a box model and what the box model actually is. And now we will come to the actual box content and how it will affect our box. To start, we will create a paragraph and give the paragraph some fill text. Then I'm going to style the paragraph and give it a border so we see the, board, the box. And I give it a border of gray. Then I'm going to load this in our browser. Okay, now. And you see our box here. To change the content within the box, you can, for example, simply change the style of the text or font. We can change, for example, the font size. So let's change the font size to 24 pixels. Open the browser again. And you see it affects our box. Our box gets bigger because the content gets bigger. Also, we can change the font family to sans serif, for example. And see it changes our text and in specific cases it changes our box of course too because different fonts use different sizes or like yeah sizes and settings and also we can change the font weight let's set to bold you see that affected totally our box and let it grow a little bit more. Now we can change also the font style. For example, to inherit initial, italic, normal, and so on. I will set it to italic. And you see our font is now italic style. When we use font uh, font indent then I think I wrote something wrong here one second italic text indent was not font indent then you can actually give the first 
line of text, a little bit space. It's a 12 pixel. Now you see it pushes the first word to the side and the rest. And we even can now change the letter spacing or the word spacing. Let's just change the word spacing. This is the space between the words, obviously. So let's say 10 pixel. This will look now pretty odd. But also letter spacing, we can add say, five pixels just to demonstrate you. Now we can add our box a background if you want to, a background color. So let's add a golden background color. Now you see our box has a golden background color. If we want to, we can add even a background image by background image or just background would do it too. Now just open placeholder.com. We will use that more uh, in future lessons. So I'm just going to copy this here. and paste this and then I set our background size to cover. It has the background, we don't see it because it's stretched and fits to the rest. So I'm just going to give our box a width and height. Let's give a width, 250 pixels and a height 250 pixels and I'm going to change the size of our placeholder image to 250 times 250. Now notice, now we see our background is, per uh, the, pic the picture is perfectly fitting, but our text floats of course out because, out because we have too much text. We can set of course the height to auto, that would, would it do, but just let's not use that much text here. Also like this and we'll load and you see we have here our background image and we have our text. Now what we also can do is we can add a box shadow property. The box shadow property can actually add something outside of the box. The box shadow property, you have a little bit to experiment actually. You see, we have now here box shadow. Let's make it not extreme or black, let's make it like slightly gray. And you see, we have our shadow and our box. And now, you also could do rounded corners by adding the border radius property and set it to 100% will make it a circle. Let's see. Now, later we will talk about images because images have some specific rules because they behave as an inline element. If you don't know what it means now, don't worry. We will discuss that later in a lesson. Let's have now a look at the display property. All of our HTML elements do have a display property setting. Most of them are block level elements. That means they take the full width of the available space, so no other content will be next to them. I will show you that by creating some of these block level elements or just cre creating some text and they are block level elements as we will see such as a div container so what else a paragraph a headline 
and the unordered list, for example. I create all of them and give each one some content. Learn ipsum as fill text. Maybe here a little bit more. It doesn't do it. Lorem. Now it does. Okay, then here's some other tags, and here we give some links and list elements. I mean, I will add number one. Let's just do it like this number. Now I'm going to say two and three and four. Open this in our browser. And now we have here our HTML elements. Each one of them is a block level element. So they take full width, full width of the available space. In this case, 100% of the document. So they float underneath each other. I'm adding now again everywhere a border on each one of these elements so I'm going to say div p h1 and on list will have a border one pixel solid red and open the browser and reload can you see each one of them as box and every single element is a block level element because it takes the full width. Now, if you add padding, for example, to one of these elements, so let's do this with the div element, then the padding, also the margin or a border, will add to the size of the block level element. So the size of the padding, the margin and the border will be added to the size of the box. If I give now the box a size, let's say 400 pixels here, and also a height maybe of 300 pixels, this will be our, our div box here. I give it a, a different border color. Maybe I make it green. So you just see the difference. And now I'm going to add padding. Let's make 20 pixels to all of, si all of the sides. You see it grows. It's not 400 pixels anymore. Now we have to add the 20 pixels to the right side and to the left side to our width. That means the actual size is now 440 pixels and the height is the same. The actual height is now 340 pixels. And if you want to avoid this kind of behavior, you can change the display property. We will come now to that. There is the next one we will talk about is the inline value of the display property and this will make our box to an inline element that means that the box is in line with the other content so if you add padding margin or border to the element it will be added relative to the normal position of the box so let me do that let me display in line here you see how that affects our box and actually how our editor our our code our visual studio code underlines with this green line here our properties width and height because they're actually unnecessary now here so let me just delete them Now, if you add padding to this element, I said it will add it relative to the normal position of the box. So, 
just delete now the padding. So you see the difference. So you see it will take no space. And now I'm going to edit again. So let's see. 10 pixels this time maybe. And reload. You see how that affects the, the, the box. Now uh, you can use the inline block proper display property to the element if you want it to behave like a block level element and still remain inline so you can add padding margin and border normally to it. Let me do that by inline block. You see it normally affects the box as like as a block, just it's now an inline block, so it doesn't take full width. And if you set the property to inline element, I said you can add the margin border normally to it. But you can add more values to the display property. One of the values is actually a flex, which I will discuss separately with you. Also, you could add table or table cell to your display property for vertical alignment of your content. Welcome to the next lesson. In this lesson, we will talk about images. Because images are inline elements, I will talk about this separately now in this episode. So why are images actually inline elements? Well, think about emotions, smileys and so forth. They are commonly used within text messages and they appear in one line with the text. So they all inline. If you add a border to your image, so if you nest the image within another element, you may notice there will be some space between the bottom of the image and the bottom of the parent. Let me show you that in CodePen because it actually doesn't work in my regular browser. So I'm going to create a div tag and nest within it an image tag. And I give the image a source of this URL here, which is just a placeholder image. Now we will see this here. And now I'm going to add to the image, to the div, excuse me, some border, one pixel solid red. And now you will notice the space between the bottom of the image and the bottom of the div. So why is that? This is because the image is sitting on the baseline of the text line. And it's not something like padding or margin predefined by the browser or something like that. So if I just now use a normalized file, which resets the browser settings, it will still appear. And this is something you can fix, of course. And you fixed it if you just simply set actually the display property of the image to block. So I'm going to say image block and, and it disappears. So the image becomes a block level element. In that way we can use padding, margin and so forth with our element. We will talk now about positioning. If you don't set any value to the position property of our HTML elements, then all the boxes are shown one after the other. With the position property, we can manipulate that behavior. By default, it is static. That means it will be placed 
by the normal flow of the content. Let's just make that a little bit visual and I show you that by creating a div tag and I'm going to create three of them. But let's give them all kind of a class, let's say box. And each box will have a border, five pixels, solid, red. We'll have a background color of green. And mm, this should be actually all. Now let's open this in our browser. copy the path in and we see this actually but of course we don't see anything without margin so let's add a margin of 12 pixels now we see it let's give each box a height 50 pixels so really see this box and you see we give none of the boxes any positioning value so if you want to manipulate this behavior we can set for example the positioning property to relative so i'm going to select the first box i'm going to use here nth child this is a this is a pseudo selector we will discuss later now i'm going to add the positioning attribute I'm going to set it to relative. Let's open the browser. Nothing will change so far. So, but we actually can now do something. We can use the properties left and top and bottom and right so let's just say now we will go from the top 20 percent open the browser and reload and you see our box is now placed 20 percent from the top also we can use here a set index which will give our HTML elements additional access. The set access it means three dimensional, so we can actually have layers. But for now, let's just use the positioning. So if we use the relative position, we can use the top, right, bottom, and left property to set it the position. Often the relative position is used by a parent element to position the child elements. I will show you that after we talked about the value absolute and we're going to do this now. I'm going to reset this here. I'll leave that to relative and I'm going to select the last box. Number three. And I'm going to set the position to absolute. Now the box actually floats completely out of the location and it will be taken out of the normal location and it will be positioned by its parent. If the parent is not set to anything or is set any to anything but, but static, then that the HTML element will position by the HTML document. That may sound a little bit confusing. Let me just show you that. So this element here, our box, doesn't have any parent which is set to relative or absolute as well. So it will actually now be positioned relative to the HTML document. So if I'm going to say now here 50% and 
and top 50%, then it will be assigned here in the center. Well, it will squeeze uh, squeeze together because the content and the 50% on the left. So let me just do it like this. Actually, the content floats out. Let's give it just a little bit of content. And I didn't set any width. I just forgot. So let's give it a width. Hundred pixels. So you see, we can position now this element as we want. We can, for example, say fifty percent on the left again. Now it's not positioned in the center directly, as you would assume actually, because you say, "Well, I'm positioned at left fifty percent on top fifty percent. Shouldn't it be in directly in the center of our screen?" No, it is actually not like that. Because the document or the, the element will be drawn from this point on this point here, the upper left corner of this box. This is the center. From this point on, it draws our box. So we actually have to reset the, help, the half of this box and also the half of the height to get the absolute position of the center. So we can do that actually. We can do that by using transform and then we say translate and here we just use minus 50 minus 50 to do exactly that what i just showed you and now it's perfectly positioned in the center of our screen now i told you that if the parent of something absolute positioned will be anything but static then it will be positioned within the boundaries of the parent so i'm going to show you that by creating a new box the give it again box of course the class and within the box i'm going to nest another box looks now like this here but I will actually delete now all the stylings here so everything will be in the same flow this looks now like this first of all I will select the last box this will be number four and I will give it a width of 500 pixels and a height of 500 pixels like this and I will set the position to relative nothing happens yet so but now I'm going to select the nested box I give it actually a different class here let's call it the next box so nest box and I'm going to give it width and height as well let's give it a width of 100 pixel and a height of 100 pixel and just a background color of Let's say yellow. And now let's see. Here it is. And now I'm going to change the position to absolute. If I reload now, nothing happens because it automatically sets left and top to zero. But if I'm going now to say here, right, zero, top, zero. Our element will float to the right zero and top zero position of the parent because the parent is relative. 
The same will happen now if I'm just going to say that the parent is absolute. Nothing changes. Of course, the position of the parent changes a little bit because position is absolute now. But the child element still assigns or is positioned within the boundaries of the parent. If I do now delete this and put this back to relative, I will now actually delete this here from the parent and put here back to position. And I will reload now. Then you see the box is again positioned on the right zero and top zero position of the HDL document. And now there is another position value we can give. The last one is called fixed and works exactly the same as the position absolute with one exception that the position is set relative from the viewport and it's fixed there. So you see we can scroll here. If we now going to add another box or just let's take here the second box because we didn't use it yet. So the second one, I'm going to add here position fixed and say left 50%, top 50%. And I'm going to add here again, transform, translate minus 50%, minus 50% because remember, this is how we center absolute elements. Now we have the element here, but I'm going to add actually a width here, 250 pixels and height, 250 pixels. And now we have here the element and if I scroll, it's there's not much content of course, so I don't scroll that much, but you see it's fixed in the screen. It moves when I scroll with me, it's so fixed to the viewport. I just give it a little bit more content now. Just add here another boxes. And then I reload. So a little bit more to scroll, and you see it's totally fixed. And it's just you can just scroll with it. This is how you create kind of parallax effects and so on. One essential thing in your page will be of course links. You always want to refer to the external page or you want to even refer to an internal page. So whenever you do that, you use an anchor tag or anchor element. You already pretty sure I'm, you know how you look that, it looks like A. And it has usually an href attribute. And this href attribute, we can target now different things. Whether it's an external link, as I said, so I'm going to add this, for example. So, for example, let's say I'm gonna add Google. And this will be my external link now. So I'm going to click on Google. It doesn't redirect me because it's actually adding this Google page on in the end of the domain of CodePen. But it would, of course, redirect us. I can show you that in a other example then when I use Visual Studio Code. Anyways, you can use here also an internal page. So you can refer to an internal link or to some anchor point. So you would do that the same actually. But then if you want to refer to an anchor point, you're gonna do the following thing. You have now this A here, or let's create quickly actually our little navigation again. So just to repeat this thing, another list. I can 
do anything for 70. I'm in the list. It doesn't let me uh, create a pen. Let's redo it quickly. I have no idea what it is. What is happening here? Just a little, yeah, whatever, little bug. Okay, we have now another list. We have eyes, and we have with no eyes or an anchor tag. And let's say I just make four elements here. Of course, it still doesn't work. So let's make four elements and let's give it an anchor here, an anchor here, anchor here, anchor here. This is our navigation, right? And then we create again like this placeholder pages. Let's create how many elements we have? Four. Let's make four. So I'm gonna set quickly the placeholder. So with 100% and height 1000 pixels. Some background. Give it a background placeholder. Again, then the same thing, and child. And this time we stop the second one, of course, because the unordered list is our first one. So the background color, green. Then I'm gonna add the placeholder, yeah, child three, background. Yellow placeholder jaws four and background let's say red and the last one placeholder and child five background purple all right perfect well now we want to refer to this elements so we have to give actually each of this placeholder elements another attribute the div has another attribute we call it an id and we say here this is our about page for example so this is our product page and this is our doesn't work today well um, this is our um, block and then we have something like contact now each one has every element has here some kind of ID right let's make quickly at least normalize here that annoys me a little bit it doesn't take the full look all right and now we have here our anchor list. so i want to refer here to the about page and here i want to link to the product page here i'm gonna link to the block and here i'm gonna link to contact and of course we can quickly style the whole thing let's make it like that quickly let's say Pang zero margin zero and li will be our display inline block. All right, it's okay for now. Let's give quickly a, some padding, 12 pixels. Remember why it doesn't work, it's an inline element, so we have to say display block. Awesome. All right. Imagine, uh, notice anyways, by also by the way, that you have a much more clickable area if you add display block and the padding. And now I'm going to refer to the links or to this IDs here. So all I'm gonna do is add the ID. So type ID, of course. I'm gonna add the about ID. 
product here was the block right and here the contact so if I'm going to click now on one of these elements it yeah shows me the page then right contact is our last one the black one is the red one and so on so you may have noticed this on this typical one page scroll websites where you just scroll down actually the whole time and then you have some icon or some button where it brings you up again and this actually works the same uh, except there's some JavaScript of course for smooth scrolling and stuff it scrolls much smoother and if you click on a button it automatically rolls up to the top and this is how you refer to internal IDs and pages like, like IDs like anchors and what you also can do actually with the anchor tag is to refer to a file you want to download to show you that and to show you how to open external pages and how to modify a little bit how you open them with the target attribute i'm going to open now the visual studio code uh, should, should be open now here this is our visual studio code normal HTML file. I have here some example DMG file, doesn't matter what it is. And first thing, I'm gonna add a normal anchor tag and refer to external page, google.com, because it didn't work the previous time. Google, hmm. I'm gonna save this and I'm going to copy the path, I'm gonna paste it here and open it. And you see here's our link. I click on it. It adds that path to our file you see here. So what we can do here actually, we can modify the anchor tag by setting a target. And let me do everything correctly here. So I HTTP and I'm gonna say in the target link we'll now see in a second what that does this is reloading and it opens Google by the way and it opens Google on a new page in a new tab so not at the our same page so we have always to go back then or whatever so if uh, the standard behavior would be it opens in the same tab right which is called self actually so that does the same thing like the standard behavior the default behavior so i'm going to do this again here it opens google on the same page and don't forget to add http so it won't just add this thing on your local path and this is how you do that now but let's see what else we can do now and we can refer to a file so all we have to do is copying here the path or writing here the path to our file in this case our test dmg i want to download and is it is already in our root path so i'm just gonna add this here and say here download me save that and reload and click this and you see you can download it i'm not gonna do this now because it doesn't make sense but you could do it like this so you refer for example on your page on a specific path or folder or something and if you can download um there are new files or you visitors can download files congratulations you made it so far now we will talk about lists and we start off with the ordered list and it is what it actually says it's an ordered list so it's a numeric list or like yeah a, a numeric list usually but of course you can change some behavior of that list and we can do some interesting stuff with that so let's create an ordered list 
Now all that list you create with the keyword OL and you give within the OL some child elements. That's, these are LIs. And I give now six LIs. And I just give it some, I don't know, some names or something. Let's make some cities. Rome, Athens, New York, and Prague. Then maybe Moscow. And then Berlin. And you see already the default behavior of our audit list. It's a numeric list from one to whatever how many elements do we have. And this is how it yeah shows up there. But you can change actually some behavior or some the way how it will um, count your stuff or how it will show that list. So you can add some attributes. First of all, you can uh, add something like called reversed to your order list. So let's just do that, reversed. And you see it reversed the order of our list here. So it starts now from six and counts down. Also, what we can do is setting actually a start value. Let's say start and we give it a value of 10. So it starts counting from 10. That's pretty simple actually. So there's nothing more actually to explain about. What else you can do is changing the type. Well, this means how does it count our or list our elements. We can also make it alph alphabetically. So we give it a little A. And what it does, it says now A, B, C, D, E, F and kinds of like this. We can make a capitalized uppercase letter and it counts still just with uppercase letters. And what we also can do is adding a I. And now you see it's listing in Roman numerals. You can make this big too. So let's like this and you have uppercase, flexible measure, Roman numerals. That's pretty cool. Huh? And default, of course, it's number. Of course, you can still give it like this as an attribute and it normally counts off your list. And of course, you can also nest your lists. That means if you want to make an order list in an order list, then just do that. Let's create another order list and with another six elements and in this six elements you have I don't know some something else or let's actually do that a little bit different let's add this ordered list in another li element and let's say ll and li make just four and you see now it looks like this let's see now we have put here something like Berlin again and now I kind of here I don't know cities in Germany for example Stuttgart oops, and Cologne Munich Dresden. So you see, this is also pretty simple, and now we can give it a file, of course, a different type. Let's make this now alphabetically. And this is all about, you can say, about the ordered list actually. So if you need to just, yeah, you can choose which, which kind of type you want, and then write like this. More interesting will be now the unordered list what we will talk about in the next lesson and we will 
do during this whole lecture section uh, project, we will already start creating our first sticky navigation, which is pretty cool because we already use positioning and we already use like uh, yeah all kind of what we learned before all that stuff which we learned before we finally gonna use and I hope you'll like that finally now we speak about our unordered list because the unordered list is so pretty interesting because we are creating navigations out of it usually and let's start right away I'm gonna create an unordered list with ul and give it again chart elements allies and let's say four and this is our unordered list yeah let's get us let's give it some names for example like this and we have now here our unordered list we can add again some attribute called type and change this little icon here or list icon and we can edit and we can change it to a square for example so we have now a little square if you can see that and also you can say disk and yeah of course circle and what we can do now is actually we can nest elements as well as in the ordered list so i'm gonna add another unordered list with let's say three allies exactly and we change here the type maybe to disk and give it some another names let's say I don't know mm, Brian Peter and um, Jed um, so this is actually our, our list there's nothing not that much to talk about I mean how the list itself works I mean uh, you of course can add also or nest like within your unordered list an uh, ordered list that's not a problem you can just do ordered list and give it uh, again some three elements of course not like this and here we give it I don't know pass boat car and it's nested like that you see that well, but interesting will be if we can change here kind of the behavior of this whole unordered list. We can say unordered list and give it now some elements. Like I give it mm, L, I, and A and give it five of them. For some reason, it doesn't do that. Just one second. So it's supposed to add now all this stuff here, but it doesn't. Well, whatever. Let's just do it like this then. And add here an anchor tag. Anchor tags are just links. I'm not going to talk about it later. And add here some. Like, I don't know, let's say block and news and shop, maybe. And this will be our navigation. Of course, it doesn't look like real navigation so far. So, we're adding some CSS. And what I can do is just like make all our eyes, as you remember, these are now like block elements. So, I'm going to make all allies inline blocks, inline block. And you see they float next to each other. And this is actually how you create navigations, plain and simple. And yeah, and so forth. And in our next episode or next 
lecture I'm going to create with you our first project and it will be a sticky navigation. So a navigation that sticks to the top like we already talked about in the positioning uh, lecture and just a little bit more detail than I want. So I hope you to see I hope to see you there and I hope you will like it. Now to our first real project where we finally use what we have learned in the previous lessons. So we are going to create a sticky navigation. Sticky navigation you probably have seen on some pages. I don't know, let's um, see we go to uh, some kind of blog or something. Let's see if we find out something like that. I have no idea actually. Let's see if uh, WordPress has this, the page. Yeah, actually it has, yeah. You see, this is a sticky navigation. It sticks to the top, even if you scroll. Or let's say, I think Twitter could have something like this. I don't know. And it has a sticky navigation too, you see here. And yeah, this is simple and plain a sticky navigation. Of course, with JavaScript, you can do then some good animations here. So if you scroll down, it disappears or it makes it smaller, it shows some details or gets transparent or something like that. But to the sticky navigation itself now, we are going to create a, a div or let's make it left and then we are going to create within the nef some unordered list and within the unordered list some ris and i want some anchor tags and i want this four times it doesn't do that i have no idea why okay let's make it hand with the hand bone like this and let's say a here, a here, a here, a here, and here an anchor tag. I don't care about the href attribute so far, I'm just gonna add some menu points. Let's say product, and tutorials, document, documentation, maybe about us and maybe a contact page this will be our navigation and then i'm going to add some other elements because you want to have scroll that whole thing so i'm gonna add some yeah placeholder elements Let's make three of them and let's make them first actually let's create the styles for the placeholder the placeholder does have, will have a, some different background now let's make first the basic styles so i'm going to say with 100 percent and height view height and Oh, let's make the view of two. Oh, flow, I keep here hidden. And yeah, this should be all right actually. And now I give each placeholder. I'm gonna use here some pseudo element. You don't have to care about it now. You, I'm going to explain all that to you later. Basically, it's just this element, this nth child selects now the first one of these placeholders and I'm gonna give it a background background of green and the next one I'm gonna give a background of red and the next one the 
let's get a background yellow this should be red for and let's give it some some color actually so it doesn't add actually to what I'm right so far uh, this uh, is a little bit ah oh what we shouldn't forget here to reset our CSS base or like normalize it um, what the hell? let's make a min height let's say 100 percent and it worked 100 percent should actually give it now let's click overflow delete actually I don't know why I added it I don't know uh, it's usually it should work with uh, view height view height and view width but for some reason I don't know so let's give it just 100% and here's some I don't know, some width now whatever and some height now um, it's not important actually it uh, doesn't matter now um, you see just we have some content here and yeah uh, the last one I just created how many did I create actually I created one two where is the green one ah the child doesn't is not right of the child of course I have to make two three and four because a child if I say add child it counts all in our document root now so the net is our first child this is our second child this is the third and this is the fourth so now it works all right so i'm gonna add now the styles for our navigation so our navigation is position fixed right it's supposed to be fixed i give it a background color there so we see a little bit the whole thing I'm gonna make RGBA and give it a white and a little bit opacity let's say six all right so I want it to be completely 100% white here and when you remember the previous lesson on the list I want to have this list points there floating next to each other I mean I can do that several ways I can do it like this I can say li and give it a display inline block of course that works so we have now already our many points here or I'm going to say just float left that they float next to each other as well both works uh, both has different behavior though and let's say display event block for now event block I don't know why I always write block I don't know um, and, and now we are adding the A as style I want a style to be color black or let's at least make it really dark gray or something like that that's too bright i think uh, for some reason i had a of course i see that here and uh, let's make it like this maybe like this it's a little bit better like this i think like like this is good i uh, give it a text decoration to get rid of that underlining and everything you see like this and I give it actually a padding I give each element a padding of let's say 12 pixels I think this should be fine and I have to say here display inline or let's let's make a block level element display block why I'm gonna do this you saw it actually doesn't add a top and bottom padding well that's because it's display inline 
So anchor elements are displayed in line. So to change this kind of behavior, I'm gonna make a display block and you have see it's adding also the padding to the top and bottom. Now what I'm going to do is add some hover behavior. So when I hover over this element, I wanna kinda, kinda change the background of this element. And I make it just plain white, or let's say RGBA 255, 255, 255, and 1 for no opacity. And if I see a float over that, I have this box selected. And well, I don't want any of this spacing here. I didn't give it any padding, right? So I don't know, somewhat gives here some margin, so or like padding automatically. So let's say reset this. And now we got rid of this. Uh, we can, of course, say now to send it the whole thing if we want it. It looks maybe better, I don't know. So we can make text the line center. And we have now a whole navigation centered. And as you see, we scroll and our navigation stays, right? That's quite nice. Could be also we want our navigation on the right side. I mean, all you have to do is like, let's float it, you know, float it right, and it's on the right side. You see, this is how you work with navigations and how you create just a simple, very simple sticky navy, simple sticky navigation. And now you could add some stars, some JavaScript, let's I mean, let's say you select now this navigation and you scroll down and if you come to a specific point or it's kind of you scrolling down and you make it completely white so the opacity disappears so it's like opacity one then and stuff like that. And of course you can put much more stuff in your navigation, put maybe instead of just one ul, uh, UL out of the list, another element in and that floated left for a logo or some some social buttons or something like that. But for the basic understanding in the first project, I think this is okay, it's enough. I hope you understood everything. If you have some kind of problems to redo this whole project, please message me or open a question. Uh, I'm sure everyone will be happy to help you. Let's start with our first lesson. Every one of you may be familiar with CSS basic selectors like the element selector. Like we write something like ULLI and then color red, which selects all LI elements within the UL element, every LI element which is nested in the UL element. Also, you might be familiar with the ID selector, which is written like this. List, for example, ID list gets selected or the element with the ID list gets selected. And I give it a color green. Then we have the class selector. I'm sure everyone is familiar with that too. When we give it a class, for example, work, and say color purple. Now I'm going to write quickly a UL list. Three LI elements, I just give it some name, max, read, and all. Then I'm going to create a list ID, just let's say we give this li element the ID list and this one, the last li element, the class 
password. Now I'm going to open the browser just to demonstrate you how it looks like. And you see the first one is red as we selected all li elements nested in the ul element. Now, why is Pete and Paul green and Paul is purple? This is because we override the stylings. Pete has the ID of list and Paul has the class of word. So we simply override it. Now we are going to just delete the class and the ID. And maybe extend it a little bit here. Let's say we give it another UL element and nest another L element, three, and give them some female names. Let's say Paula. Um, uh, something like Francesca. I, don't, I have no idea how it's written. Francesca and Tina and then more li elements another three with more names let's say Tina uh, next we have let's say Andy and mm, Bob all right now I'm going to show you different selectors you may have heard of or but you don't completely understand them. Let's say, let's see. The, the first selector we are going to use is this one. I'm going to say UL LI. Uh, one moment for that. I'm going to change the UL here to a ordered list. And now say color and let's say we give it a color of something more colorful long green I'm going to delete this three stars here and now I'm going to open this and you see all the LIs are selected that are nested in the UL, but not the ordered list and the nested LIs. Well, this is because this is a child selector and so it selects all LI childs of UL. So the ordered list is not a child of the UL list. I mean, it is a child, but it's not the LL chi LI child. So now you can see the difference if I say UL and just LI, so the element selector, and say color green, you should see now this here. It overrides all of them because it selects every, every LI, which is child of that one. So it selects all the nested elements. If I just switch this now and take this one on the top, select this here, and that one I'm just going to delete. Now show you again, and you see all the LIs have the long green with the child selector, and that one has the element selector. Now we are going to do something further. We are going to say something like UL class name, let's call it class name, plus LI. What this is going to do, i show you in one second. Let's give it a color of red. And we give you here some element, the class name, the class class name. Let's say we give it the Tino class class 
as name. And now let's see what happens. Nothing. This is because I gave it UL and then of course LI. And now we see Andy got selected. Andy is red. Why is that? That is because we select their li with the class class name and plus li that means we jump just one li further and this is andy and this gets selected so it is red now i'm going to say li that class name and then i'm going to use the till design oh sorry till design and again li and say color and we give it here this chocolate color let's see what happens bob is this color has got no this color and any got now this color hmm this means we override it and this basically means that all the li's after the class name so after the class class name gets selected so Andy and Bob every element after the element with that class this is what this selector basically does in our next lesson I going to show you attribute selectors and I hope to see you there I'm going to show you the attribute selector let me show you quickly the universal selector I'm sure every one of you is familiar with something like this here star or universal selector and background red if i'm now going to refresh the browser you see the browser or the, the window is red the body is red this is because i selected basically everything everything in my html document so if i'm now going to create something like and headline and let's say another headline and another headline and give it some text and do now something like color and let's say white open the browser refresh then you see everything or well, all the headlines are white because I selected everything so I universally selected all the elements in my HTML document. This is nothing new, as I said, but you can do something else with that. Let me show you by creating an unordered list with some LIs, like so, let's say two, and within the LI, I nest another unordered list with again two LIs. Now I did something one moment yeah like this and on this again like this all right uh, i think i did a little mistake let's let me just redo that let's see make it just like this so here again on list and another on list and here another one Ah, of course, not like this. I want two allies. All right, now I give it just some names. Let's say Max, let's say Peter, let's say Frank, let's say Matt, Matt, and Andrew, and what else? Um, Paul. All right, I'm going to show you now just quickly how it looks like I am sure you know how it looks like like this so one unordered list nested another unordered list and nested another unordered list now I'm going to select a specific part or a specific layer just imagine it as layer this is the first one this is the second one this is the third one so depends how deep you nested this element I'm going to say under the list universal selector li k 
color red. So what do you think will happen? Uh, let's see. You see, Frank, Matt, Andrew and Paul are red. That means I selected all LIs. They are nested within the first layer, underneath the first layer. This is the first layer. So I selected the second and the third one. Now I can do something else. I can say UL star space star or universal selector and color green. Going to open that and you see I just selected Andrew and Paul and they are green because I jumped basically just two layers down. This is how the universal selector basically works. Of course, you can combine it with another selectors as I will show you in the next lesson with the attribute selector where I'm going to use it too. So I see you in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, we talked about element selectors and class selectors and ID selectors, so basic selectors. In this lesson, we're going to talk about attribute selectors. We can do a lot of cool stuff with that. I'm going to show you how that works by showing you first or creating first the input element because we need an HTML element which contains an attribute. So input, I'm going to create four of them and each one has already an attribute type you see here. Now I'm going to add attribute name and I call the first one first name, the second one last name, then email and then password. All right, now I'm going to select some of all of them actually by a simple attribute selector called just input and each input which contains the attribute name. I'm going to color this red background. One thing to just show you that better, let's say we add a placeholder, let's say first name, last name, email, password. All right, I'm going to open this in the browser and reload and you see we have here four input fields with a placeholder and all are colored red because I selected all of them with the attribute selector by saying each input field with the attribute name make the background red. Now I'm just going to quick put these underneath because I don't like this as much so let's say display block and margin go to a little bit pixels 12 pixels yes this is all right okay now I'm going to select some others let's say we want to select a specific one with the name attribute which contains password Now I'm going to say background green and you see it gets selected because we selected the input field with the name password. Now we can do a lot of interesting stuff with that. We can say for example input name and then I'm going to use the dollar sign and equals and say again and then that again say just name and say background, let's say yellow. Let's see what happens. I'm going to select the first and the second one. Why is that? This is because I, with that sign, I say, select each input tag where the name comes in the last spot. So name is in both cases here, the last part of this whole string here. So I'm going to select that and make the background yellow. 
he of course can kind of flip that here by for that we need of course something which looks a little bit different let's say input and say name name the something i'm leaving out now that placeholder and now i'm going to say input and instead of this sign i'm going to use this on equals name and say no, sorry background let's say blue it's going to load in the browser and you see i selected this one because this tells exactly the opposite i want name in the first spot now i'm going to do something like this here name and star equals name and say background let's say we make it this here and as you see i select three of them because now i'm going to say each attribute with the which contains name it doesn't matter in what spot we have that so i select all three of them and give that the color fuchsia so you see you can do a lot of stuff with this attribute selectors in the next one i am going to show you some pseudo elements pseudo classes i hope to see you then let's come now to pseudo classes there are a lot of pseudo classes in css so i'm going to show you the most important ones and to show you that i'm going to create different input elements HTML elements so let's create first of all let's say five input fields I don't know if we use all of them but let's try first so I'm have here I have here um, uh, input field of the type email and I'm going to say name email to you and I also give each one a label like this. Okay, the first one has a label email, of course. And of course, it's for the input field email. The next one will be password. password for the input type password and name password then I'm going to create here instead of type I'm going to create number let's say min 0 max let's say 10 and step one of course name i shouldn't forget i forget this would be here number this is for number then i'm going to create two checkboxes or just one checkbox actually uh, let's say boom something like mail so it's for mail mail and here this I'm going to delete and I'm going to make it just a p tag and say something nothing too creative all right um, I'm going now to see I uh, select a label tag and I'm using brackets and I'm going to say name email and here I say valid now I say here border let's say for pixels solid 
screen. So if I enter something in this, not label, in this input, sorry, in this input tag email, which is valid, HTML5 automatically recognizes or notice that if there's something not valid, a token which doesn't fit to the email. And if it's valid, then I am going to add a green border to it. Let me show that to you right away in the browser. Refresh. And now if I go just to this here, you see the green border disappears. I'm going to add now an add something something and dot de or dot com or something like that. And you know it's you see it's uh, well you see it's uh, getting green. Now I can do exactly the opposite. So I can say input name email invalid. And then I say again border pixel solid and here I say red. So let's refresh. And you see it turns red because it's not valid. Add something, something, and it's green. See, that works. Not, uh, now I'm going to add something here in our password one. I had required. So this input field, there is something required. We have to fill it out before we continue. First, I'm going to select the input field with usual attribute selectors. Uh, say here, name password and here say required because it's required I give it a board again solid let's say here the backup purple going to reload and you see it's selected it's required it adds this violet border here And now uh, let's see, we are going to continue with the number input. I'm going to select the number input. I say here type number. And here I say something like out of range. I think it's pretty self explaining what it means. So anyways, I give it a border. If it's out of range, I give it a border, just two pixels, solid, red. So I guess you know, or you already know what it means. I added to this input field a range from minimum zero to maximum 10. So this is everything right here. See, if I put something out of range, it should turn red. Oh, I didn't refresh, of course. And you see, it turns red because it's out of range. I can also, again, turn that and say, got exactly the opposite. I'm going to select again the same one and say in range. And this time I give it a border to pixel solid green. Same thing, reload, refresh, and you see it's green as long as I don't overstep and put something in which is not valid. This works really great, so let's continue with the last one, which will be the checkbox. So first we select again the checkbox. We say input, not input, we say type, checkbox, and now we say checked. So if it's checked, I'm going to add something at the p tag. I'm going to change the color of the p tag. And I make it, let's say, a different color here, let's say blue make blue 
So refresh, going to ticket, and you see that changes. So now if I untick it, it changes back blue and so on. So you see, they are pretty, pretty handy and pretty convenient, this pseudo glasses. And I hope you understood everything well, and um, I'll see you in the next lesson. Because it was so nice, I'm going to show you some more city classes, such as empty, disabled, read only, and read wide. To show you that, first of all, let's try empties. So I need, I'm going to need input, some texts, name, name, first name, and. This should be all. Maybe another one just to demonstrate. Name, last name, and now I'm going to say I'll use our attribute selector again. It's going to say I select each input field with a name, or let's say just each. Yeah, let's practice it again. Let's say name, and it should be with the Remember, with the we select each input field with the word name in the end. So I'm going to do that by this, adding this dollar sign equal sign and then name, and then I'm going to add some style. But now I'm going to say it should be empty just if it's empty i'm going to add a background and the background will be red now i'm going to open the browser and to reload this and you see both is red because both is empty now i can do something like Let's say I um, keep this here. Let's say uh, add here disabled. So this one is disabled. And I say now the same input. Just going to select uh, both of them name equals name. And I say here disabled background green and let's reload this and you see i selected the first one it's still disabled so i can't click on it and i selected this one now i'm going to show you the read only and read and write you can do something like this you can make a paragraph and you can say it's um, content editable without any anything else. So it's a text. And now if I reload the browser, you see some text here. And if you click on it, you see you can edit the text here. You can delete, write, everything. Now, of course i can select this i can select this by saying p and then i say read and write because this is on my rights i have the rights to read and write in this p element so i'm going to change the color here to fuchsia and just to show you this doesn't select the other one, I'm going to create another one. And the normal one, and this has some more text. And let's see in the browser. I just selected the editable. And you see, it applies to that one. If I just want to select each or every P element which is not editable so i'm going to say just p and then uh, read only read only 
and let's say I make now here the color gray let's just add some a little bit more p tags text and let's make it like this some more text and let's see they all have the color applied for that because they're all not editable so they're all read only so i selected all of them these selectors can be pretty handy sometimes too so i just decided to make an extra lesson to that i hope you liked it and see you in the next one We'll talk now about pseudo-elements. Pseudo-elements, on the contrary to pseudo-classes, just create four elements. So you can style them in pseudo-classes select elements you, that are already existing. To show you that, I created two paragraphs here and I'm going to style them a little bit. I used the uh, knowledge of the previous lesson, the pseudo-classes for that. So I'm going to select the first of type of the paragraph and then I say something like first line or let's say first letter first and I say give it a color of red and I can say text size not a text size of course font size and give it 36 pixels. Now I'm going to open this in the browser and reload and you see I selected the first paragraph and the first letter. We can do the same with the first line. So let's say I say here again first type and first line. Now I'll give it a color of green and also a font size 24 pixels going to reload and you see perfectly selects the first line in our paragraph now there are some pseudo elements you might know already for example the before and after one just do i still show you of course now but i want to say the last of the time so we select the last paragraph and now we say after and add some content here let's say edit some text here and um, let me show you what happened we added after this paragraph just some content here some text now I can do exactly the opposite. I can also say last of type before content edit some text in the beginning. And now I'm going to reload. And you see we added some text in the beginning and in the end. This kind of pseudo element can be really practical if it comes to creating some forms, drawing or some styling, some new website, which I'm going to show you later. Also the content in general, the content element generating content can be really handy. Uh, I will show you much more on that too later. Just hope you like this lesson and you can see that it's pretty practical to style your text and more of that later. I wasn't really satisfied with this before and after attributes I showed you, this kind of pseudo elements. So I am going to a little bit more into detail with that because we, I, I'm sure we gonna need it quite a lot actually actually nowadays you need it a lot in web development if you create even like little tool tips you can use before and after elements or if you 
draw if you like make a tooltip at all because for example this little triangles on, on a speech bubble or whatever this kind of element you see sometimes this is also a before element so to show you that I'm going to create a little diff and let's call it right away actually hmm, let's call it some kind of tooltip or also what we could do I know what you're going to do. I'm going to create with you a timeline. A timeline is, yeah, like it says, a timeline and like a like a vertical line. And there you see different elements. And there's like a point on this timeline which shows on this point something happened or on this point there's a form or whatever. I mean, just let's create this so. Uh, I'm going to create a diff of the class timeline and then I'm going to give it a child element and I call it timeline entry. This will be an entry, a little box or something which some, with some content which points on that specific uh, point of the timeline. But before I'm going to do this, I'm wrapping this whole thing up here, so you see it a little better, so I'm going to use a wrapper. And then I'm going to just copy this stuff quickly in here. Exactly like this. And wrapper space. Alright, so we have this timeline entry here. And within that entry, there comes in some. For example, we can now just write some timeline content. For example, and before that content, I add some timeline headline, or I call it flag now here. This is like a headline flag, and here comes some content. All right, now I'm going to set the wrapper quickly. I want it to have it a max width of 80% and a margin of zero auto. Let's make it top a little bit, actually, margin. And then I'm going to create a timeline. The timeline itself is just takes the whole width of the wrapper and has a border left. This would be our timeline actually. So I'm going to say three pixels solid and let's make it black here. You can see this is our this is our timeline. And it's of course pretty short now. It will grow with the content and with the entries. And what I'm going to do now is creating the flag right away. So timeline flag. Oh no, entry first, of course. Our box here, which will have actually a different background. So color would be kind of convenient here. So let's set it a different background. And actually, not the wrapper needs the background. I want the whole body to have the background. So let's change the background of the body. Right. And the timeline entry has the background white. You see this is this whole thing of course. And now I'm going to say display inline block because I want the whole width here. And I also want that it has a margin from the left, definitely. Give it a 25 pixels, maybe. Let's see how it looks like. Yeah, this is all right. And what else I'm gonna need here? I'm gonna add here our before pseudo element now. So I'm gonna say timeline entry before. So what I didn't tell you that 
content is always needed, otherwise you won't see anything at all. So you can write here anything, it won't be shown if you don't write the content attribute here. So now I'm going to set the whole thing position absolute to absolute position it. But remember that lesson about uh, positioning, we have to set actually this here position relative. And and what happens here actually to or do better imagine it or do better understand the whole concept of this before and after what it actually does it does actually the following thing we have now here our timeline entry and within this entry element it creates us a before element like this or not like this of course like this of course not the right thing like this more you can imagine like this you have now here before and now here you have another element after this is how you imagine or how you can understand that better what it actually does here what this before and after element creates for us. And many people think actually it comes off, out of that, uh, that, that parent, so it would be here before and then there and after, but it's always within the timeline entry. So because of that, we have to set it, of course, relative, so we can position it absolutely better. So what I want now, I want it left zero, top zero. And I want a triangle, right? Pretty simple. I just create a border, 10 pixels, and set, say solid, and I say transparent. What kind of triangle we need here is the one that points to the left, which would be our border right, actually. So I set the border right color to white. And there you see already our rectangle, our triangle, excuse me. And all I'm gonna do now, because we also set this margin and everything, I set 10 pixels not left, I said minus left, actually a little bit more, 20. There is our triangle. And now I'm going to continue here. I wanna quickly completely show the whole kind of little project here, what we're gonna do. And I add a padding here. Let's add a padding of 15 pixels. See, it looks a little bit much better, I think. It looks much better. So we have now here on our, our little content box and this headline flag here. It's our timeline flag. Timeline flag. Our timeline flag that gets kind of some special treatment. It has a padding on the bottom, of course. So we don't exactly a little bit separately from the content and I give it for example a font size a bigger one say 24 pixels exactly and now I told you I want to show or wanted the triangle there to point onto a specific uh, yeah point on the timeline yeah right so I'm going to use the, for that the bef the, the after element. I use here after because for the before I used already this triangle. Uh, but before I'm gonna do this, I want to add more entries. I want more of these little boxes to show point more on our timeline here. So let's create quickly another one. Here another one. Exactly, so we have that here. 
and what have I got? What I didn't do, of course, I have to say here. I put it here inline block. Let's leave it the block actually, and let's give it just a width. Or are we leave it inline block? And let it float. Of course, this needs some points here. Uh, I know it doesn't make sense actually because then it doesn't work with the before element. Let's just make it block here. Let's make it block. And if we want it not so, so wide, whatever, then we just change the width of 300 pixels or something. Like this, exactly. And we give also a march um, top here, 25 pixels, exactly. And yeah, that's all. And now I'm going to add the after element. So I'm going to say timeline, after, our entry of course, it's part of the entry still. And of course we need the content, like I said before, this is really necessary, you always have to write a content attribute. I set the position absolute too. I need it left, I don't know, I just guess now minus 40 pixels, I don't know actually. We will find out in a second. I get a width of, yeah, let's say 20 pixels. A background of black here. And board or not uh, mix. Don't forget the height has to be the same one. And then I'm going to add a border radius of 100%. And you see, we have this little points now here, so I'm going to adjust it a little bit. 35 is not that great. Let's make seven maybe. Yeah, this, this seems fine to me now. And now we have our points here. Of course, we can make something like a, let's say, border. Yeah, two pixels maybe solid. And also black here and just gonna delete here the background exactly and I need it a little bit more to that side 39 let's me create oh, 39 is, is fine I think of course it shines it's like, like we see of course the timeline uh, border now so I'm gonna set the background actually to our body, the same color as uh, I have to gave the body, and now it gets this effect like it's uh, you know like shining through, and the first one for example is active. Let's say now we have here in each of those kind of flags, uh, uh, entries. I mean, like a, a form and like uh, some input elements and a button and. We, for example, submit now this form and then this one closes and the next one opens or something or then here's like kind of a tick or something or a cross if something is missing. For example, like that. Now, uh, I want to set the first one on active, for example. So I'm going to add a class active. And the active class does the following timeline entry active after and content here same and gives it a background of black you see so just the first element which is now active uh, later of course you would do that out of just kind of, you know jQuery or JavaScript or whatever you check then if it's active or not and uh, give it a class active and it has some automatically black or that 
circle is uh, has a background color. Uh, this is how it works, and you see how you can use effectively the after or um, the before attributes. And I hope you understood a little bit better. There is actually a little bit more about before and after, but um, it's not important now in our case. So with that, you can already ha handle a lot of stuff and do have fun and just play a little bit around and if you have questions of course feel feel free to ask me we will come now to a pretty big topic and a pretty big thing in web developing and essential actually at all because it's about forms forms you find in all the pages all kind of web apps and stuff you always have to fill out forms it's kind of a little own thing it's kind of art to really handle forms well so to create a form we're just going to write a form element it automatically creates for us this action attribute and here we specify what kind of action we want to submit when we submit a button. This could be now post, which will make an HTTP post request and sends this request to the server. We also could get uh, make a get attribute or a get method. This will be sent a get request and yeah this is actually yeah we'll just make a get request and how it does that is always you need a button of course which will yeah which will actually do this whole thing and let's do it now like this let's for example create a button here and click and if I click here you see it loads here something because it tries to send a get request and you can add here specific things again you can add here a target like if you remember the anger tag you can say here blank again and if I'm now going to click on this button it opens a new page and sends them the uh, request and redirects here or whatever you want to do here you can give of course the form a name like uh, login for example then you can refer it for example if you have then like a select element you can refer the select element to this form now the form is not just built like this usually you have a form then we have some label and this label directs to an uh, input field which will be named uh, now name for example so i'm gonna say name here then have an input field where name and id name the reason why i sent here id name is that if i click on this label it automatically selects the input field if I delete now this ID name here, nothing will happen. But we want actually this behavior. We want that it selects our input field when I click on the label, right? And to create forms, like I said, is a little bit of a hard thing. I will go more into detail after that and more into detail about the label and the input and whatever you can do then here you can make a checkbox for example and let's create quickly one so you have here a checkbox or like a radio button then you have here a radio button in a second actually not video button just radio and here you have your 
radio and these all these elements which puts a form together and in the next episode or next lecture i go more into detail into that you also create some forms of course because this is a really mm, not tough thing but you can do a lot of things wrong so in the next lecture i'm gonna show you more like i said previously we go now a little bit more into the details in the form especially the labels and input elements and for that we're going to create a form simple form give it an action of post and maybe a name of let's call it again login and now I'm going to create a label and I told you previously I can use this for attribute to assign it or like kind of include it with or combine it with an input field I do it with the ID of that input field so I'm gonna say here for example name now like I did before name and then I'm going to say input and give this ID of name when I click now on name it selects this input field here there's another way you have you can do that without actually using this for attribute at all you just simply don't write this input field outside you write it within the label so now you have this field in here and now if you click on the name you select automatically the input field there are different ways to do it I mean you can choose if you want to use more the for attribute or you just simply nest it in your label now we are going to come to the input field oh, well before I gonna do this it's maybe to, uh, also important labels and input fields it's really good for browser that uh, google and so on and screen uh, screen readers reads that stuff so always add a label to your input fields it's also a convention and you just just do that and later i'm going to show you also how to structure it right but for now just remember always add a label to your input or nest your input within the label and now we come to the input field and we see already and automatically puts the type attribute here we have different types of inputs this is now a simply text yeah type so i can just add here text and actually let's uh changed it to number and what it does now we have still this input field here but we can here choose numbers see that and we can actually also add now something like a min which is zero and the max which is 10. so now i can go below zero and i can go above 10. see that this is our input type number now we can add input type color i need to kind of delete this min and max here and what this does it opens uh, the open action on my other screen uh, field here this depends actually what browser you are using what kind of how the field looks like here and now you can choose here some color uh, whatever color you want to and I think you just submit like this yeah and then you have you know selected the color here nice and the next thing you can do is a checkbox a checkbox we know already 
name makes not that much sense maybe a uh, sense now let's say i'm male here and we are going to choose between um gender or something like that so i'm gonna create here a label male and maybe here another input I'm gonna delete this or here and let's say here female here checkbox and now we have here female or male or we are I don't know maybe I don't know, both or something or it would be either actually usually you would use here something called radio instead of checkbox boxes and then you would be able just to select one of this kind um, what else can you add actually you can add a date so now you have here date or you can with html5 you can click here and you can select a date or oh, just write it here that's pretty self-explainable uh, as well as you can add a file just full file now you can choose a file from your yeah from your uh, computer actually let's quickly this is again a little annoying let's make a label display block so i have this underneath i should top here fix this or something just to a little bit see it better and the next thing you can add is also month for example now you choose here the month and the year it's pretty similar to the date one uh, additionally you can add password now let's see what that does here let's actually add this to password and you see it actually just hides our input this is the password type and then we have something like range and now we have like this kind of thing here this kind of yeah range slide thing here i think we can also make a min here like one mix 10 something like that now you see already there's like the steps here you see like you see and Another one you can do is time. Then you choose just you know, a time. And you see there is a lot of stuff you can do with this input fields. Well, to really go deep into details about that, what you can also adjust a little bit on time and number, color, checkbox and so on. I suggest you to go to the Mozilla Foundation, to the MDN, if you just Google that, you will find it right away, or I put you a link down there in the description, and you find much more details about this input types. Now, let's create our first form. So let's start right away with our container, because I want to center actually our form in the center of our screen so then let's add another div and let's call form wrapper then i'm going to add the actually form give it action post for now doesn't matter actually and i give it something called input group and i'm gonna make a div make a class input group the reason i do this is 
I put like kind of a, make a kind of a row. So I put always a label and an input element in one input group and stack it on each other. So I stack it. And so I can control also better the distance between those input groups and it just looks better, it's better structure. So now I'm gonna add a label and I'm gonna add input element. The label is for the name. So name and the input gets ID name. And yeah, I'm going to do this actually a couple of more times. So I just gotta copy this. So another one, another one. So we have now name, or maybe let's make it like the name. Let's make uh, surname. Uh, yeah, let's say S name, S name. Then I'm going to make a let's leave a name here name so name and the name is right then i'm going to say here email save it here too email and id email exactly and the last one maybe make another one let's make a password one Pass and pass here and there. Password. All right. Okay. Good. And what I'm going to do now is styling. So let's style the container first. So we center the whole thing. So I'm going to use here position absolute left. 50% top 50% and transform translate minus 50% minus 50% perfect before all that make sure you add normal haze and auto prefixer and then I'm going to set all my items box sizing for the box remember why we do this so it doesn't add the border the padding to it or actually width of the elements then i'm going to select the body and give it a background color of a little darkish gray like this and now we are coming to the Form wrapper and the form wrapper gets a background white exactly like this and no padding so I make a padding dot 12 pixels and then here maybe 9 pixels or something or well, let's make it 12 here 16 here seems fine to me and mm, let's leave it like this first for now let's leave it like this and I say that all the input groups have a width 100% if this were a plot of course I don't have to set that I mean there anyways this per plot and they have always um, a padding top of let's say oh we just make padding in general let's make padding in general let's say then I make a padding of eight pixels at zero mm, let's leave this one now 
and then I'm going to give the label display plot because we want everything underneath each other it looks good I think it looks not that bad and now I'm going to say that the label has a rule padding bottom and I always make the putter uh, the padding between the label and the input field for pixel. It's like also a convention I have. And actually let's change this to 20. Actually I always do it like this, 20. Um, that's a little bit wide. Let's make 10 here in this case. 10 is fine, maybe 10 is fine. And next thing will be actually a button we didn't add at all so i'm gonna add quickly a button here so why don't we make now input and type button this works too or submit we can do it like this of course uh, or we add a button well, like like this this is kind of your decision. I mean, you can do it how you want that. So uh, we have now this button here, and mm, that's good actually. What I actually did now, I gave the input group, the first one, a padding from the top. I don't want that. I just want this padding between these elements here. And because of that, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say input group. I'm going to use a pseudo element. You're going to see later. It's called nut. And then I'm going to select the first child. And here I'm going to add this padding and not there. So this actually just adds all the paddings except of the first child, which is this one here. And now we have this elements here. So, uh, but the thing is then it doesn't add actually, doesn't make sense here because now it doesn't add the padding bottom too so this was kind of not the plan let's make it different then it's it's complete right so let's just make the input group first child not first child make yeah let's make first child and the first child does have no padding top that's all okay then we have this now so we have a surname we have a name email and password what we're gonna do and i always suggest you to do additionally always write a placeholder in your input fields so i'm gonna actually select all of them i'm gonna just select and hold command and select the other input fields as well like this now i'm gonna say placeholder and give it some placeholder text so here i'm gonna add a surname there i'm gonna add name there i'm gonna add email and here i'm gonna add password and we shouldn't forget of course to change here the type because we don't want to see the password when I read it so when I type you something it's like hidden and it's still too much distance so let's make it like a little bit less here I think S is uh, it's better eight looks better uh, all right we have a lot of this and we have this button and we have all the rest too. What we can do now to like, let's make it look a little bit better. So I'm 
gonna add here a box shadow. Let's see, one pixel, one pixel, three pixel. This, this is, do you see something here? Let's make it a little bit this. Another three. Or we simply just add RGBA. RGBA. Like this. Make it black and set the opacity a little bit lower. Like this. So now we have our input field, email, and so on. And always a convention is to write your input fields underneath. Don't write them anymore next to each other. Always try to write them underneath. Like I said, the space is important. And that's actually, yeah, that's about it. We can, of course, we should add maybe like a little kind of headline or something. Let's add a H5 maybe. And let's see on this H5, like login. Exactly. Yeah, this login has a little problem, and this login sets and netting has a padding actually. Uh, now you see it's gone. So we have another form wrapper, and maybe I add here the H5 quickly and give it a padding button too. What, how much should I give here? Or maybe put it for pixel. Actually, it's more here. Well, so too much here, and it's not big enough actually. Well, also, let's just make the font size a little bit taller. Like this, yeah, this looks. I think this looks better. So this is our little form here. Uh, we going to also select the button now. I mean, it looks pretty ugly like this. So I'm gonna select the button with selecting the type. Submit. To the selectors, you will hear a little bit more later. Or I did it before because I have to tell you, I mean, I am going to, I record most of my lectures like different times. So it could actually be, so this section already just changed my mind and I put this section now later after all this uh, selectors because I have an extra section, of course, for all the selectors. I hope you like it. And I put this lecture afterwards or this before, but I think it will be afterwards because it makes more sense because I'm going to use here a lot of selectors actually. So now I'm going to, I selected that one and then say here for none quickly. So just you see it actually selected the background, none as well. Right. And I want actually a border, I want one pixel, solid. Gonna use this huge as well. That's a little bit too. Right, let's make it like this maybe. Yeah. Or uh, let's make it the same way here. It should be a zero 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 point two three. Three is okay. And a padding of six pixels maybe. Yeah, it doesn't look that bad. And I need also a margin here because I don't have that space here that I should have. We remember we gave here each one eight pixels, so I'm gonna say eight pixels here to the top. All right, perfect. Now we can just submit this button, or we gonna just I don't know, cancel it. I don't know. Let's make value. Login and make another one. Submit.
Oops. Well, you cancel. Exactly. And now we have here two buttons, so we can cancel or we can log in. And this is our little form here. Uh, you can change yourself now a little bit, like the width and height or paddings and uh, the colors. Experiment a little bit, makes it more look beautiful. Maybe the input feels much wider a little bit here, I would say. I'll also show you how you style input fields uh, much, much better, like the styling also like the placeholder and stuff and like that. And I will do this, I will put this probably in the section how to. Um, and here I am more handle, uh, tell about the basics and understanding and like a little show how to do that. But uh, like uh, specific problems like styling, like button differently, buttons differently, input fields, radio buttons and so on, I'm gonna make in the how to's. So if you're now interested, scroll down and click on the how to section and then just watch it already if you want to. You finished your first chapter and now we are coming to the next one. And now I'm going to show you how to draw with CSS. In the beginning, we make with triangles. How do I actually create a triangle with pure CSS? To show you that and to demonstrate you actually how that basically works, I'm going to create a div container with the class of triangle or plural triangles not capital T of course actually we don't need any content on it so and then we are going to give it some basic stylings triangles first I'm going to set the width of zero and the height of zero and then I'm going to say margin zero auto to center it in the screen. And what comes now, this is the thing which, what, what shows you, demonstrate to you how this whole triangle thing works out with CSS. So I'm going to say border 25 pixels solid and I give it a red now so what do you expect to see now let's see we open our browser I'm going to reload and all you see is a rectangle actually why is that I mean to show you really how that looks like actually with these borders now I'm going to give each border a different color and first I'm going to set the margin from the top a little bit. Okay, and now I'm going to say border left green and border right. I'm going to set blue. Now I'm reloading. Oh, nothing works. One second. Uh, of course, I want the color, not the whole border. And reload. And you see actually how it looks like. We have a lot of little rectangles, a little, a little uh, triangles here. Four little triangles. What it does actually, it's kind of each one gets, gets the same space within this rectangle because we set the height and width to zero. So the space or the, the, the width of the border has to go somewhere. So it kind of, you know, gives each border the same width. And then this is how this triangles appear. Now I can, I mean, of course we have now four triangles, but if we just want to have one, we can simply set the rest to transparent, of course. Let's put this two here, these two to transparent and reload. 
you see we just have this two triangles left of course we won't do it like this then i mean let's let me show you that on a practical on a, on example let me create a speech bubble for that i'm just quickly renamed class name to bubble and say bubble First, I'm going to set this whole thing to relative. Give it a width of 250 pixels and a height of 100, let's say. And then the same thing, I'm going to use a margin to center it. Let's look quickly. Then, I, of course, I need a color let's say we give it a, a slightly gray like this here i'm going to set also the border radius a little bit so just to make it look a little bit better good and within the bubble i write some text hey how are you all right course it doesn't look that great so I'm going to set the padding a little bit and the font size a bit bigger and you see it looks better all right now I'm going to add this little triangle here on I mean you can do it how you I mean it's different ways to do it you can make them the left on the bottom right top let's create it on the bottom to make a bottom one first how that works is actually you say bubble then you say before then you set the content to zero because we don't want any content but you want to of course do appear something some style so Position is absolute because we have to set it to the bottom and to from the left. Let's say let's make 25 pixels. The bottom depends how much how high the height is of this whole triangle. Let's say. 30 pixels and just to make a little look a little better I am going to put this here in a separate line like this and now I'm going to create a border okay we need a rect a triangle looking down that means we need the top one so it says we make border top I'm going to say 30 pixels solid and I give it the same color of course as the bubble and the border right I'm going to give just 20 pixels solid and transparent because we don't want them to appear really border left 20 pixels solid transparent and let's see how it looks like. Of course, we don't see anything. Um, that may, might be because, let's say, oh no, not like this, sorry. I mean, let's make minus here. And here it is. So, this is actually basically how it works of course if you want now for example one on the top then you would um one moment create not the bottom a uh, border tops the border bottom you would then of course uh right here and if you want one on the left you would appear them and what then you would set the top and the bottom border to transparent 
It might take a while until you figure it out, but I'm sure you will do. And thank you for watching. In the next one, lesson V, look at some different forms. Our next shape will be a ribbon. A ribbon actually just contains a rectangle and on the left bottom side a triangle and on the right bottom side a triangle. And we will just appear half of each triangle. There are of course other ways to do that, but let me show you by that way how simple it is actually. First we're going to create a div container with a class called ribbon. Then we style the ribbon or ribbon body first by giving it a height and a width. With let's say 300 pixels and height, uh, let's say 150, uh, let's even 200, uh, 100, yeah, let's say 150 and height 300 pixels. We set a margin again, 150 pixels auto to center it, and background color of green and precision relative all right just see what's happening here we see in our browser this is just normal rectangle and here we will now create our first triangle and then our second triangle by using the pseudo class before and after ribbon before this will be our left one set content again nothing and position again absolute then where we want to put it it's on the bottom i make here minus 30 pixels now and left zero then our border actually so we want the left one so it means border left 30 pixels or what what width do we have 150 so it actually makes sense to make it 75 and the half of 75 is 35 so we make 75 pixels solid and green and border top will be then our solid transparent one and border bottom as well all right uh, let's look quickly how it looks like. Yeah, almost there's a little offset here. Let's uh, just delete it by making minus 30, for example. Yeah, that fits perfectly. All right, and then we are going to create the right side ribbon with after pseudo class. Content again, the precision again, absolute, bottom is actually the same, 30 pixels, but instead of left we know use right because we want to know the right side of our ribbon, then we need the border right, not the border left here. The Size is the same, solid green and border top 30 pixels, solid transparent and border uh, bottom 30 pixels, solid transparent. And here we go, we have our ribbon. Hope you liked it and in the next one we are going to look at another shape. See you then. This shape is an octagon. 
The octagon is a shape with eight corners. And actually it's pretty easy to do so too, like the rest of our shapes. Uh, but just for better understanding and to be not leave anyone confused here, I'm going to show you by a basic example how that actually was, how this form is set together. And I'm going to do that by creating again a div tag and give it a class oct. Let's just call oct. And now I'm going to give this one some style. Let's say width 40 pixels and height going to leave zero. And then I'm going to create a border, border top, 30 pixels solid blue, a border right, 30 pixels solid green, and a border left, 30 pixels solid green. Then I'm going just to make this quickly a little bit from the top and center it. So more than 50 pixels and auto. Then I'm going to load this in our browser. And what do you see here actually is just the bottom of our octagon. If you want now our top, it's nothing but just exchange that from border bottom uh, top to for the bottom and you see it switches and we have the top of our octagon and between that is actually just a rectangle that's all of course you won't create it like this we will use before and after pseudo classes again of course so I'm going to delete this here and this here because we are just basically creating like a cube. So width and height, height 100 pixels too. And background blue. Okay, sorry for that. And position relative. All right, now I'm going to use the before pseudo class and I said like we did before with the, when we just used the div class without before, the height to zero and we give the width of 40 pixels and of course we set again the content And we set also to position to absolute. And now we are going to create the borders. So border bottom, 30 pixels. Solid blue, because this is the one we want to appear. And the border right, it's also 30 pixels solid. In this one, we're going to set transparent. And the border left. 30 pixels solid transparent. All right, and now just let's look quickly. So for nothing, one second. Now we have, of course, also to set uh, position relative. I set. After set, of course. Also the after one tag. After the same thing, height zero with forty pixels. Content empty here. Then the precision again, absolute and the border top this time. 30 
30 pixels, so blue, and the borders around it, so left and right transparent. And here we have to set a margin. 70 pixels. And let's see. Doesn't appear yet. Uh, this is because a little mistake here. To set it right. And here we have our octagon. Pretty simple. Okay, let's see what we create in our next lesson. But I'm definitely sure it will be another cool shape. We will learn how to create a special shape in CSS. We will create a heart. And to create a heart, you might think it's like set from two half circles and a triangle or something like that. But it's actually pretty simple. To show you and demonstrate that again, I'm creating a div with a class heart. And now I'm going to say with, of course, heart selecting first. With, I'm going to 70 pixel and height 115 pixels, height, of course. Right, then uh, the background, the blue. Let me show you what I did just. This is basically just this rectangle here. I'm going to center it and uh, let's make a little bit space from the top too. And then I'm going to say a border a radius and I'm going to set just the top border so the top left and top right border and the rest I'm going to set to zero which made it look like this now here and now imagine this turn we use here just transform rotate 45 degrees or minus 45 in this case. Now I'm going to reload. And you see, we now just would create another one here and you would have a perfect heart shape. Now again, we are not going to create here two divs and then lay them over each other and something like that. We just use here again the before and the after pseudo element so to create that to do that again i'm just adding now here before and i also create now your hard after right in the same line let me put this here now i'm going to add here position absolute and content again of course zero and before we do all that I'm going to set our heart itself to position relative all right this we can just leave like that except that we right now here left 70 pixels and top zero this is right and most right let's look how it looks like we just basically it's still the same everything here and now i'm going to just select the after run hard after because you want this one a little bit different and i'm going to say left zero 
and then we transform it to and say you rotate 45 degrees and reload you see already it's like this here now I just have to change the origin the transform origin from what angle or from what origin it actually rotates so I do this with transform origin and I say here 100% 100% see it's like here and of course I have to do this here too transform origin 0 100% And we have our heart. Perfect. That's just now great because the heart shouldn't be blue, of course. Let's make it red. And we have our red heart. This will be all about shapes so far. And in the next lesson, or next chapter, we're going to talk about animations, transitions, and so on. We finally now put into practice what we learned before. So we are going to create a little bear illustration with pure CSS. And let's right away jump into it and start with the container. We will center the whole bear illustration or this bear head within our window. So I'm going to use a container. Then I'm going to create a div class with the head with the class head I'm going to nest all the other elements now within the head div class and I'm for the first element I'm going to add is the ears I want that twice of course and I'm going to style the container first and I position it Absolute because I want to use left or right, left 50%, top 50%, transform, translate, minus 50%, minus 50%. That's all about our container. Now I'm going to start a head. I want the head to be 300 pixels wide and 200 pixels height. I give it background of burly wood and I'm going to set the border radius to 100% and the position relative because I want to position absolute the child elements and then I want to add a border solid black or let's use just this code here then I'm going to open this in our browser and we have a nice shape of a head already. And now we are going to style the ears. The ears should be wide 50 pixels, height 50 pixels, so a nice equal circle for the radius 100%, position absolute and border five pixels solid and this black here open in the browser yep just of course adding the background color use here burly wood as well good i will all of all both ears i want to set the z index to minus one because I want it behind the head there it is now I'm going to position each one of these ears so I using here the child selector the pseudo selector child and I'm going to deselect the first child which is the first ear I'm going to say set it to top 10 pixels and the right ear 
I'm going to set the top 10 pixels as well and write 0. Now we have our ears here. Now we're going to add the eyes, the, the class I twice. So I'm going to write class, select class I, and I'm going to say width 10, 15 pixels, height 25 pixels, background, going to make it completely black. I want a border radius of 100%. And quickly, let's have a look. Looks good. Now I'm going to position the eyes. So using nth child. This is now not the first child, of course. It is the third child because it's the third child of our div container of the class head. So this is the third child, this is the fourth child. So I'm going to use three and I'm going to set it top. 80 pixels left 80 pixels of course I have to set the eyes to position absolute and then we will let the browser there's our left eye now we do the right eye for top 80 pixels and right 80 pixels. See, that looks pretty good. So let's create our nose. So diff nose. Okay, our nose should be white 80 pixels, height 60 pixels maybe, border radius 100%, background black, and position absolute as well. I'm going to say top 60%, per percent and left 50% because we want it, of course, centered in the, in the middle. So I'm going to use transform and then translate X because I center it in the X axis. So minus 50% and let's open that. It's a little bit big. Let's make it smaller. Let's see, 60 and 40. Yeah, that's better. And now we are going to create something like a mouth. It is not really a mouth, it's just some line underneath the nose that gives it a nice kind of style, but I just call it mouth. Actually, I have no idea how you call it. So the mouth, I did it of course now in the style. Of course I have to add this here so we have our, we have already our mouth now to add of course the style ah, excuse me I was a little bit confused here mouth and I'm going to set this width uh, white of mm, 10 pixels and the height of 20 pixels well, let's make it 30 and a background of black again then left 50% and bottom 0 that should do that actually of course I have to set it to absolute otherwise we couldn't position it uh, it's not that and we of course have to center it absolute so I'm going to use transform here translate X again minus 50% and it's not 
high enough, so let's make it let's make it forty. This looks actually alright. Actually, it's better if you set the nose a little bit lower. I'm not so satisfied with it. Let's set it. Let's set the nose not to sixty-five percent, maybe. Exactly, looks a little bit better, I think, and the high is a little bit lower as well. Let's see, ninety. Ninety. This looks much better. This is our bare illustration actually. You can do much, much more complexer stuff. And I hope you maybe will a little bit try yourself how to do that stuff and find your own little illustrations and create some cool CSS art. We will talk now about transitions. And to the best way to explain your transitions is to going to show you that on a simple example, it will be just a button on the center of our screen where we are going to change the background color and the color of the text. A transition itself describes just how long a particular state change should take and how it should actually change. We take, for example, the change of a background color of an whatever element in our screen or our HTML, and the transition says what particular it should change. So the background color, how long it should change, should it have a delay until it changes, or should it also have a specific way how to change? Should it ease in, ease out, or something custom made? How long it should take and this is actually what a transition is and i'm going now to show you that on this example so i have here our html document and i'm going to create now the container first so a div container within the div container i'm going to nest a a element or anchor element and this says click me. Now I'm going to center this container by using position absolute top 50%, left 50%, transform, translate minus 50 minus 50 before that i'm going to reset the html and body styles of the browser by setting the margin to zero and the padding to zero now i'm going to select the a tag And I give it some styles to make it a button. I'm going to say font size 24 pixels. And then I'm going to say padding 8 pixels and 24 pixels. I give it a background color of Oranged, orangered, orange red, sorry, orange red, and also a color of white. And I'm going to change the font family too to Helvetica. Also, I want to change the text transform to uppercase and I want to delete any text text decoration so the, the underline disappears which should be all 
Now let's see what it looks like in our browser. So I'm going to reload. That looks pretty good to me. And now we add our finally our transition. And I'm going to show you now first the long hand way. So this just needs this transition. And the first thing we will enter now is the transition property. So which property we are going to change or what we want to change. This would be the background color here. Then the next one will be the transition duration. How long should it take? Let's say three seconds. Everything after that will be optional. It would definitely work now, right? This, but we can now add a transition delay 500 milliseconds and we can add a transition timing function, which means the way how it changed. So, standard or the default value would be ease, then there are linear ease in and ease out, ease in out and what we will talk about later, cubic B0. For now I'm using ease in which kind of fades slowly in or changes our elements slowly in and this should be all and now I'm opening the browser again and reload. Of course nothing happens yet because we have to add our change tr anchor with a hover pseudo element and we want to change the background color. So let's change it to green. Now open the browser again and reload. Let's hover over it. And you see it slowly changes to green and with a little delay of this 500 milliseconds. You can add, you can use here for the, uh, for the transition duration, milliseconds or seconds, of course also for the delay. And if you want to make now a second transition, we just don't want to change just the background color, you want for example also to change the color of the font or the text, then we are just adding a comma behind it and saying now the second property, this would be color, and you want to change it with um, two seconds and with a 200 millisecond delay and we say is out here. Now I'm going to change that also, color, black for example, opening the browser, reload and let's hover over it and you see it's going to change, the transition works. Now I showed you the longhand version, I'm going to show you also the shorthand version, even it's really more useful to use the longhand version, it's just looks prettier and it's faster. But especially in the beginning it may help to use maybe the shorthand version. So instead of making this transition and adding then all this we want all these options, we are just can we just can say transition property. Now we add the property. Then we say transition duration transition delay and transition timing function and series in and it would work perfectly the same of course. Now I told you there is another timing function that we can use which is called cubic bezier. With cubic bezier, you can actually adjust yourself 
how slowly it goes in and how it ends or how this whole transition appears to give you a better picture of that there is a help there's a website it's called cubicbazir.com where you can actually look how it looks like by adjusting this little handle here you can perfectly kind of create your own little transitions now if you click on go you see how it looks like and let's do it like this here you see this it's pretty interesting and on the top you see then always the settings you use here with this little graphic of this thing let's do it like this maybe let's see what happens yeah you have a little delay here and then it goes in let's use this one so i'm going to copy this then opening our editor and at this values here let's save let's see how it looks like uh, okay you don't see the well that in here mm, you maybe want to make another example also to show you better how everything how it works so to to, to practice it so let's create quickly something like a round object let's say i make here a diff and let's call it a ball now i'm going to delete all the stuff here let's say container ball will have a width of let's say 50 pixels and a height of 50 pixels and a background a color of red and a border radius of 100 percent let's see now we have a little ball here and we want it to move a little bit to the right or left so first of all we either uh, add a transition we want to change the transform property and we want to have them say in 0 0.75 seconds and with a 200 millisecond delay and we say ease in now i'm going to add this let's say power u2 and then i say transform translate x it's a 200 pixels let's see how that looks like and let's open the browser and see the changes now you see it moves to the to the right. Or what we also could do is changing maybe just the um the the, the transformance actually right. We leave that like this. We just use now instead of friends uh, tra uh, tra inst instead of translate we use scale and let's say we say two let's reload mm, this is a pretty nice animation let's see how it looks like if we use x out so it goes a little bit faster course if we use now linear it's pretty straight so just 
Oh, there is now slowly or something coming in. Let's just right away use our transition. So let's leave it in with this ease in. And it slowly starts and goes down a little bit faster. I think it's fine like this. So you see how transitions work. And you can play around with it a little bit. And I'm sure we are going to use it in one or another project later. And in the next lesson first we will talk about animations. They're actually pretty similar to transitions and they, you write them kind of in the same form. And I hope to see you then. This lesson we talked about CSS transitions. Now we are going to talk about CSS animations. To show you that animations are not that hard and actually, how, especially how you write them or declare them, pretty similar to transitions. I'm going to show you that on a simple example again. We will do a couple of scandals, don't worry, but first of all, we are going to create a loading animation. For that, we need some loading cycle. First of all, I can declare or write again an HTML div tag with the class of container, which we are going to center and within, I'm going to nest a div class with the a div tag with the class cycle. Now I'm going to center the container again. Position absolute left 50%, top 50%, there is transform, translate minus 50%. Minus 50%. Then I'm going to create a cycle. I'm going to say with 50 pixels, height 50 pixels, because we want a nice round shape. And I'm going to say border 10 pixels, solid. And I'm going to use this light black here. And then I'm going to say border radius 100%. Um, what it looks like in the browser. Yes, looks not bad. But I want to have kind of an open border. So I'm going to say border top color transparent now reload yes exactly how I want it and now we are going to add the animation but before we can add actually the animation itself we're going to have to create some keyframes we are doing that by saying add keyframes giving this keyframes a name we are going to uh, Call it loading. And now we need steps. Now you could do something like from and to. But what if you want to do several steps, like three or four or whatever, how many you want, how many you want to? We use for that percentages, zero percent. And I'm going to say transform, translate, not translate, I mean rotate zero degrees and 100% transform, rotate 360 degrees. And this should be our keyframes. And this keyframes we are going to add now in our cycle class with the keyword animation. Now I'm going to show you exactly the same like in our transition class or our transition episode. I make this longhand version first because this is the most practical and most convenient way to do that. 
So I'm going to add as first animation name or the keyframes name, which is loading. Then I'm going to add the duration. The animation duration is how long should it take to fulfill this one animation from zero to 100%. I'm going to say one second. Then you need animation timing function. And for that, we are just saying linear now. We don't want any steps. You don't want to ease it in, start slowly and go fast or something. We want a linear moving. Then we could add an animation delay, which we just leave out now because we don't need it really. And I'm going to say animation iteration count infinite because I wanted unlimited infinite uh, animation. So now I'm going to open the browser and we see what it looks like. And we have a nice smooth animation. It's rotating the cycle 360 degrees infinite. Now let's play around a little bit and let's do in the next episode something else a little bit because there's actually much more what you can do with animations there's some other properties we can add other options we can add so i hope to see you in the next episode lesson we started talking about css animations and now we want to practice this actually on a very good example we are going to create a walking cycle or we are going to create a animation with some kind of sprite sheet I hope every one of you, or at least some of you, know this adventure point-and-click game Monkey Island because we are going to use Guybrush Threefoot's character and we want to make it walk over our screen. And to do that, first of all, I'm going to show you where to get this sprite sheet. It comes from this nice website here. and you can just, I don't know, copy that. I, I will link it in our notes, of course, that uh, URL and just use that URL and then for creating our animation. So this is a basic walking cycle of, our, of a guy fresh throughput. And yeah, we are going to create it now. First of all, we need, of course, some diff, which holds it but first I'm going to create again a container and then I'm creating a div container or a div tag with the guy's guy brush and first of all the container gets centered again position absolute left 50% top 50% and then transform, translate, transform, translate, minus 50%, minus 50%. And now we are going to style our Guybrush class. First of all, we need, of course, a background. And this will be a coming from our URL I gave you. And we're going to say zero, zero, no repeat. So we start with the very left picture then. I'm going to say width 100 pixel and height 148 pixels so this is the optimus the optimal height actually to see really the whole frame or the whole sprite of Guybrush three foot then i'm going to say actually nothing else let's just look what it looks like in the browser so open the browser reload yeah we have our Get first free foot in the center of our screen. That's actually perfect. And now we want to animate it. Well, we know this picture, this spreadsheet we have here, uh, is 
like length so we have this one two three four five six sprites and what we will do now is animate each one like the first one second one third one fourth one fifth one sixth one and so on and each sprite actually if we just say now here and instead of zero we say now minus 100 pixel let's just reload then you see it's uh, the, uh, it does have the new the, the second frame we just got the second frame so we just move our background actually so we can say 200 let's reload the next one 300 reload the next one okay we have here a little shoe we can adjust it a little bit then when we make the actual animation so let's put it back to zero and now i'm going to create first of all of course our keyframes i'm going to write them above this skyfresh class let's say add keyframes and i'm going to call it guy brush walk and i'm going from zero percent background position zero zero to 100 percent background position and this I already tried it, of course, will be the best one if you use 612 pixels and then zero. And now I'm going to add this in our, our class here, in our Guybrush class with animation. And uh, first I always use the name. Walk and one second should be enough and i'm going to say linear first and infinite so let's see what it looks like in our browser yeah see of course we don't want it like this looks so interesting but we don't want it like this so what we are going to do instead of linear we are using something called steps so we just divide our frames into steps the animation should do and we have six frames so i'm going to use six steps I'm going to save that and open our browser and reload and here we go we see our inf our animation guy press the foot works looks very good now i forgot something in the previous lesson because i wanted actually to show the shorthand and uh, the long hand no, i just just showed you the long hand notation but i want also to show you the shorthand version of animation so i will just do that down here even i recommend you not to use it so it's really used just here the long hand uh, version you can of course say animation name that would be guy press walk here then animation duration animation um, timing function would then the next then delay and iteration count uh, but like i said the best would be if you learn right away the longhand version let me start now with animations our first animation will be a loading spinner. I will show you how to create simple animations on that simple example. Let's jump right into it. And the first thing we are going to do is giving the body a background because I'm going to give the loading spinner the color white. So I'm going to say background fire brick then I'm going to create a div 
and give this the class name spinner. That's all, we don't need any content. And then I'm also going to reset the browser settings for marketing and padding zero and the spinner needs a width and a height so I'm giving 25 pixels 25 pixels needs a color I know it actually doesn't need a color the, the border just needs a color so let's say border we're going, I'm going to give a uh, six, six pixel of width and solid and we're going to make it white then I'm going to say position absolute because I want absolute position it directly in the center of our screen so I'm going to say top 50% and left 50% and then I'm going to make actually the top border the color of it transparent then of course I also have to make the border radius 100% now I'm going to look first in the browser how it looks like so in our browser reload and this here's our loading spinner and now we are going to create our animation first of all for, for, for animation you need uh, keyframes a keyframe you declare by the sign head and say keyframes and then you give the keyframes a name let's say I call it spin then you just use normal curly brackets here and then you say where to start and where to begin you can make now several steps you can say 0% this and then something happens then you can say 10% 20 how you want I'm just going to use 0% and 100% like I said the steps you can choose yourself you can other animations you can just make how many steps you also want I mean it depends on you and now I'm going to say transform from rotate zero degrees and here I'm going to say transform rotate 360 degrees so it makes completely one way around and that's our spin keyframe and now we're going to add this in our spinner with animation you see already if I just one second just type animation there are different things here we can declare a delay and everything else but we won't use everything now I'm just going to show you later what you can do with the other of the options and animation for now I'm just giving it the name of course spin how long one second I want to make it infinite and I'm going to make this whole animation linear that's all now I'm going to open the browser and reload and you see the animation goes this is our basic loading circle of course we can now adjust a little bit let's say make it here 500 milliseconds make it a little bit faster see it's pretty fast and there are different other ways how to set up your animation with different options and so on but I'm going to show you different examples for each of these options so you see better what works and how does it look like our next episode where we talk about gradients. Gradients are a pretty cool thing to create some really nice effects, button, nice, make a nice button look, and give a kind of a three dimensional effect. You also could make some kind of stuff like patterns and much more. I'm going to show you 
just gradients again on some simple example. We start with linear gradients. That's the easiest way and uh, kind of default value first. So I'm going to create for that a div container with a class of box and I want that four times. And the first box I'm going to give a second class called default. And then I'm going to style the box class with a width of let's say 350 pixels and a height 350 pixels and a little margin of 100 pixels or let's say 50 pixels and auto then I'm going to create the default class and here we are creating our gradient we do this with background and before I start make creating this gradient uh, a short mention about the browser support actually the browser support is extremely good so you see here you can we'll take a look on can I use.com and you see it's pretty supported by every browser except maybe Opera Mino, Mini so the basic gradients of course there's some other stuff which is not that great support I mean but the most stuff is really good supported so we're good to go anyways you make sure you should use sometimes still some browser prefixes and the best thing is anyways to use something like an auto prefixer that automatically prefixes or writes the prefix in your CSS. For this here I'm going to use the WebKit prefix and say you now here linear gradient and I or this the, the background or the linear gradient property expects now here two arguments two colors the start color and the end color to which should go the gradient i'm going to use here white and the second one black and now i'm going to open the browser and reload and we see here a little nice box and a nice gradient from white to black now we can switch this shortly here to see it also works of course the other way around so you're gonna see it goes from from black to white but there is the easier way I just return that here and there's an easier way to do that and I'm going to show this with the next box so give it a second class called horizon so of course I should write this class then too horizontal and here I write the same the background using the webkit prefix linear gradient and go I'm gonna go again from white to black opening the browser quickly see here's the second one and instead of changing now the colors I'm just going to say here I'm gonna start from the bottom now opening the browser again reload and you see it starts now from the bottom so white starts from the bottom now and what I can do here too is saying left load and you see our gradient starts now from the left to the right of course the same works with right reload works perfectly the next thing i'm going to show you is how you 
add all the other colors. Of course, you just you can you, know, you don't have to use of course just one color, and we call it just vertical gully. So I'm going to make a vertically. Again, the same background and web kit linear gradient. Now I say here from bottom and see we use here red and then yellow. See how that looks like. And pretty nice from yellow it goes to red. Of course you can also add multiple colors not just one color. So let's do this with the, this here of this div container. I'm going to say multiple so class multiple background WebKit linear gradient, and now I'm going to say red, yellow, green, and blue. Let's open this in the browser and see what it looks like. And you see it goes from red to yellow to green to blue. You can add as many colors as you want to. Now I'm creating another div one. I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to call this here position because you can change actually the position of your gradients. So for example, where should red start and where should yellow start and so on. So I'm going to say position background webkit gradient, linear gradient going to say here from the left so red yellow and a green one and see what it looks like then looks like this and now I'm going to manipulate the yellow where it should start let's say 20% Open this, reload. You see it starts now much earlier. Of course you can also use pixels. So let's say we have 50 pixels width. So let's say 300 pixels and reload. You see it starts now here at 300 pixels. You can do that of course also for the other colors. Let's say in red, let's do 20 pixels. Reload that extends just a little. If you say now here, of course, like let's say 200 pixels, then you have a much larger red here section. And if you say now here, yellow starts much earlier, then something like this will happen because there will no gradient, of course. You see. You can do a lot of stuff with this linear gradient already and play just a little bit around with it and get familiar with the syntax and everything. And in the next episode, I'm going to show you how to create radial gradients. Let's come now to radial gradients. We will do exactly the same as we did in linear gradients. So I'm going to create a div container with the class box and uh, extra class default. Now I'm going to define the box class, give it a width, 300 pixels, and a height of 200 pixels. I'm going to say margin, 25 pixels, and auto. Now I'm going to default class and I'm going to say 
background, WebKit prefix, and radial gradient. Like in the previous episode where we talked about linear gradients, we also can need two colors where we start and stop. So I'm going to use here white again. Oh, let's yeah, say white and then black. Now I'm going to open that browser and see what it looks like. And you see we have here a gradial gradient. It is though a little bit stretched, you see here. You can actually kind of change that with a special keyword here. And to do that, I'm just going to create another one div box and this we call directly circle and now I'm just going to define the circle class background webkit radial gradient I'm going to do exactly the same from white to black but in the beginning now we are going to add our keyword and the keyword is circle let's end this with a semicolon and let's load this in the browser and now you see it actually has a perfect circle shape or gradient also it's even it's a little bit overlapping because the shape of a rectangle here but we can change that too by saying contain circle. If you refresh now the browser, you see it stops actually at the closest borders of our parent here, or our, our element or HTML element or rectangle. We can change also this kind of behavior by saying farthest farthest side now I'm going to hit load okay that doesn't load properly say closest side one moment which is actually the opposite. I forgot, of course, um, contain has to go then. Now it works, okay. And now we set here fall vest site. And you see it stretches now to this border here because this is the farthest, the most far away. But uh, for our purpose now, contain is actually perfect here. So we set it to contain, and you see we have our little circle here. Now I'm going to create another one. Let's find another div container and give it this time a class called ball. And I'm going to give it a class called colors. First, I'm going to define the class ball with width 250 pixels, height 250 pixels, much the same 25 pixels, and auto. And I'm going to say border radius 100%. So we have a perfect little circle. And then I'm going to define our colors class. I'm going to say background. Okay, again the WebKit and radio gradient. I'm going to say it goes from let's say from red to fire brick. Let's load this in our browser. And you see we have a little circle here. 
you don't see much the difference here though with the colors let's say if we go from red to uh, orange and now you see that there's a nice gradient here and we can add the same kind of options here like we previously did in the linear one so i can say here as well bottom going to reload that you see it starts from the bottom i can of course also define here starting points and end points so let's say here 100 pixels and do if you remember what we did in the previous one we set that actually lower than the what red one starts so we actually have don't have any gradient so let's say 50 pixels and you see we have this kind of shape here this little i don't know what it is like kind of mountain here and then this background pretty nice you could do some 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 nice things here you can say now here instead of orange i'm going to use white see what it looks like and you have a nice little shape actually here all right let's do another one and this time we do again a div container we call you uh, tell uh, we use again ball and i'm going to say multiple so we give it multiple colors so multiple background webkit radial gradient i'm going to say now from the left restart and i'm going to say go from red to yellow to green to blue to black let's see how what it looks like here you have this nice kind of interesting created shape here this radiant and because it's so nice let's do another one a little bit more complex one say diff class complex and first of course we say ball and then complex only this time let's make a box all right so let's create a complex class background webkit and radial gradient we are going to start from 30 40 percent to 50 percent i'm going to say circle and i want the closest side closest side and i want it from white to black 25 percent starting then again white 75 percent where it starts and then again black okay let's load this in our browser and see we have a nice little kind of a i don't know donut shape in the middle of a little circle and you can see you can do all kind of shapes here you can just have just experiment and play around with it but we are still going to create a little other thing we're going to create a little background with our gradient because there is something special about it uh, i will show you so i'm going to say here of course we, if we want to make a background we would do that in our body because we want it for the whole page of course so i'm going to say background webkit for the linear gradient here and i'm going to say i want to start from the top and i want a light gray to a darker gray let's say eight here and i'm going to load this done 
as you see here, we have a nice gradient. Now in some browsers it could come to problems actually. So you should add here background repeat, no repeat, and background attachment fixed. Because in some browsers it will actually repeat this kind of gradient. So it means like it, you have just always this short little gradient and you have some kind of, I don't know, some kind of weird shape or kind of design pattern then. This will just be, a, you make sure that you have really perfect background. With the knowledge of our previous lessons, it shouldn't be a problem to create diagonal gradients. That works pretty easy by showing you actually again, like creating a div container, calling it box and giving again a default value. I'm going to say again, box with 400 pixels, height 300 pixels, margin 25 pixels and auto. Give it a default class, say background, webkit, linear gradient. And all we are going to do is using this, the first option that we, go, that we uh, write into our arguments is just saying how many degrees we want. 45 degrees, going from white from black to white and again to black and let's look in the browser what it looks like and you see it starts diagonal and we can change that of course let's play around a little bit say so that's 15 degrees A little bit more let's say if we have now 90 then of course we are again on this way here and then we let's say 12 like this a little bit you see it's really easy to make diagonal gradients great finally now our first pattern and our first pattern will be a CSS blueprint pattern which is just a blue background and a white grid array. Let's get started. We don't need any further HTML elements because we will apply everything directly to our body. So I'm going to say body, background, color and set it to this blue we want to use going to open this quickly in a browser so you see what that blue looks like. Then I'm going to attach the background image and here is where, where we are going to use the linear gradients. I just leave here the webkit actually so otherwise it wouldn't work. The browser support is anyways here, so we don't need really the WebKit. Transparent to pixel. Then we start a new line and do exactly the same. Linear gradient. Just with this time we will add 90 degrees, but again, white to pixels and transparent two pixels, then a new line again, linear gradient. This time we use RGBA as a color, 255, 255, 255, and as opacity 0.3. After the, the presets we add one pixel and transparent 
parent one pixel. Then I can comma and another line, linear gradient 90 degrees again. Then we say again RGBA. Make it here a nice black and opacity of three, 0 0.3. Then one pixel and we set again transparent one pixel. Now I'm going to add the background size. One hundred pixel, one hundred pixel, comma, one hundred pixel, one hundred pixel, comma, twenty pixels, twenty pixels. And again, 20 pixels, 20 pixels. This will give us this grid system actually. And the background position minus two pixels, minus two pixels, minus two pixels, minus two pixels, minus one pixel, minus one pixel. And again, one, minus one, minus one. Now I'm going to load it in the browser. Let's see what it looks like. And we have our blueprint background here, perfect. Now I wanted to show you something else. And uh, I'm going to show you that actually in the, in the next episode, I think this is better. This will be another background and I will also apply to it like how to use gradients on text and fonts. Let's get started with CSS clipping. To show you CSS clipping, I have here a div class with VG of corporate background and I'm going to give this class some background image. I'm going to use here unsplash.it again. You just can copy this URL here and then paste it in. That was the wrong one. And then replace this with 250 and 250. So we have uh, even sides. So each side is the same size. And then I'm going to say with 250 pixels height. 250 pixels. Let's look in our browser. Does it show it? Uh, no. Repeat, of course. Class is right. Ah, here it is. Here's our picture. I'm quickly going to reset our browser settings because I see there's a little margin here. Let's reload the browser. Now it's perfectly in the corner. Now I'm just going to position this thing here. Position absolute left 50%, top 50%, and transform, translate, minus 50, minus 50. Let's reload. And there it is, we have perfectly centered it. Now we are going to use a clipping path. And a great help for that is the page Clippy, or this tool Clippy, which you find on this URL here, bennettbd.com slash Clippy, where you have some predefined shapes and yeah, clip paths. You can just click on whatever you want to. Let's take this heptagon here and copy stuff here and just paste it in 
and save. And now we open our browser and reload the page. And here we go, we see how the clipping works and we have a beautiful, nice shape. Let's try to do something else. Let's take maybe the star here. Same way, we just copy that, just paste it, just delete this here, and let's take that and reload. And again, we have our star here, and because it's a random picture, we can just reload and get a different picture. Looks pretty nice, I would say. Of course, you can make your own clip paths. You just actually define this points here. And you see also if you just move this little circle here, which value is changing. So you could just create kind of your own little clip paths here and make some art. Because CSS provides us with this CSS Studio class checked, we can check the HTML input field with the type of radio button or checked checkbox uh, if which state we have. We can check between two states, so checked or not checked, which uh, gives us the opportunity to create something like a full screen slider with pure CSS without any help of JavaScript. That's pretty cool, I think, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And so we're going to create a full screen slider. And we do that by creating a new index.html file. I already put in the folder here a normalized CSS, which will just reset the preset CSS styles of the browser. Looks like this. You can just fetch that online if you Google normalize.css and you just copy then the content and create a new file and paste it and save it. Then I created a styles.css where we will save our styles specifically for our slider and everything on the page and the index.html which holds our slider, of course. So I'm going to say HTML. And we want, of course, a header and we want a body tag. Not a header, I mean, of course, we want a head, not a header. And, okay, now don't do that, of course, here. Yeah, let's just create like this. And let me just like make it a little bit better, like this. And then I'm going to create a a uh, title, a meta tag, and a link. Actually, we need two links because we have our normalize and our uh, normal style CSS. So normalize CSS and here our style CSS. The title I'm going to name CSS full screen slider and a meta tag just for health, just that information, UTF-8. Then I'm going to create a container for this. This will be a div tag, the class container. And within our container, I'm going to create a header. And within the header, I'm going to create four labels. These four labels will help us navigate or set our state for our input fields, for our radio buttons. Because if you click on a label and it's linked to that input field with this for attribute, you actually just check that radio button or you set it. So for now, I'm just leaving it blank and just give you each one a content name. So let's say always slide and then a number. And each one will have a different number, of course, two, three, four. Then underneath the header right away, I'm going to create 
an input field, which will be of the type radio, and write afterwards a section tag. And I will do that four times. So I'm going to do that by saying input. First, I need this presence here. I need input and I need a section. And then I'm going to say times four. And you see the plugin does it for us. Now I'm going to select all these types here by clicking Shift, Command, and L. And I'm going to say radio. Then I'm also going to add our ID. This ID will link the input field or the input tag to our label. So I'm going to call this here slide, then a number, one and ten. I call it trigger because the triggers are actually slides. And now I'm going to say here two, three, four, and our sections. Before we actually do our sections, I'm going to add this in our, the same one in our four attributes here. This is important, so otherwise we can trigger it, of course. Slide one trigger. And here we are going to say two, three, four. And now we're going to go to the section fields. Each section will have a class of slides. So I'm going to select this. We do this again by Shift, Command, and L. I now selected all of it. Wait just one second. Just let's do it like this Shift, Command, L. And then I'm going to say class, slide. Then uh, specifically, also, I'm going to add. Each one has, of course, their uh, own class. So with a number, so I say a class one, a slide one, slide two, three, four. And within our section, we are going to add the content or the this the content which should be uh, like an on our overlay like some text some headline so i'm going to add a headline there by uh, best would be like selecting all of this again shift command l then make a little bit space and then i'm going to add an headline let's say an a3 headline should be enough Okay, it doesn't do that, so let's do it manually and say headline number. And then we give here a number two, three, four. Now we have all our actually HTML we are going to need. Let's see how it looks like in our browser. You opening the browser and Doesn't do at the moment, of course. One second, okay. Now reload, and you see our input, our, our input fields here, our input tags, our radio buttons, and when I click now on slide here or slide three, it's going to select these because I told you they are linked to them via the four attribute. Now I'm going to add some style. So let me open the styles.css. First of all, some global style, so HTML and body. I'm going to set both with an high 200%. And margin and padding zero we don't need actually because we use our normalized. Then I'm going to use the container flag and I'm going to add here it's same like with an height 100%. And 
I set the position to relative and overflow to hidden. Uh, give it a background. Let's say some dark gray. I'll give it a color. I'm going to set it to white. Text line center. Let me make it a little bit darker. Let's say this here three. Now I'm going to style the header. The header will have a background too. I'm going to make this a little bit darker. Let's make it completely black. Or let's make it like this. Um, the box shadow of 0 0.54 EM, 1 EM and black. Then I'm going to say position absolute. Now positioning it on top 0, left 0 and give it a width of 100%. And I'm using a set index because I want always to have it on top. So let's say 1000. Then we go to our label text and give it a color. I'm going to use here white um, or let's say a lighter gray. Let's see where I like gray. And the cursor should be the pointer so you see actually we are on a link display will be inline block want next to each other of course and I'm going to say a, set a line height to uh, say 3.75 and font size to uh, 7 m font weight to bold and a padding to 1 0 and 1 am then i'm going to style a little bit the hover effect i'm going to change the background a little bit more light Let's see how it looks like in our browser. In the browser. I see we have centered everything. We have here our, where we later have our slides and our we can select each radio button here. Looks fine so far for me and the rest I'm going to do in part two. So I hope to see you there and I hope you liked it. Welcome to the second part of our CSS full screen slider. In the first part, we created the HTML structure. And I want you to add, please, in each input field here, input radio button, the name attribute and the content slides for each of our input fields, please. This is important so we can select each slide separately, not that so it doesn't uh, keeps the state always on because if we just leave that out so it will be always selected and we can actually change the state between them so please add that and we added the styles of course up to the hovering effect of our labels I repeat again our navigation contains just label elements because with the for attribute and the ID of our input fields, we can link them to each other and can so change the state by just clicking on the label. Now I'm going to continue here where we stopped by adding the styles to our slide. I'm going to say width 100% and height 100%. Then I'm going to set the position to absolute. I'm going to set the top zero and left 
Later we are going to set it back to zero to make this effect of sliding. Now the set index, I'm going to set it to 10, that padding to 8 EM, 1 EM and 0, and the background of something that's black here, and the background position to 50% and 50%, and the background size to cover, and a transition. We're going to say a left, zero seconds, 0 0.75 seconds delay. And now I'm going to add to each slide our background image. I'm going to do that by using an external page called unsplash.it. I'm going to show you quickly how it looks like. Unsplash.it. This is the page and actually it just gives you placeholder images randomly from the web you can use. You can set after the slashes here always the size on your pictures you can also just get randomly in, uh, pictures by just adding this this uh, question mark and random here and you can also grayscale it by adding a g between it and again you can also use you're getting a list here you get an adjacent object back and then what we are going to use is a specific image and we will use this one here. We will do that now by saying slide one, saying background image URL and I'm going to just to copy this, just go here and Take this here and copy this in here. I'm going this we leave here, but I'm changing the sizes so they won't be so pixeled. Let's say 800. And now I'm going to copy this whole thing here three times and say here I want the number one, two, and three. And of course, I'm going to change the numbers here to three, four. And then I'm going to select our slides. We new use now our attribute selector. Remember, we can just do this here, eat the ID. And I'm going to select the first one, each ID, which has slide the string here in the beginning. This will select all our slide uh, sections and our input fields. Now I'm going to add the attributes. Uh, that um, the pseudo class checked. So we want it when it's checked and add then point slide the class and setting the left back to zero. Remember we set it previously to 100%. Now we're going to set it back to zero. So it gives a slight effect. The set in the uh, 100 and the transition of course of left 0.65 seconds and ease out. Now I'm going to show you how it looks like in our browser by reloading the page. Let's see. We have our nice full screen pure CSS slider. Now just let's add a little bit of transition, pure animation to our 
h1 here by saying slide dot h3 or was it not h1 and setting the opacity to zero and transform it or translate y to 100 percent this will make it like slide up to our animation then let's say transition left uh, not left uh, we want to transform and 0.5 seconds 0.5 seconds and then we are going to change the opacity with 0.5 seconds now i'm going to select this the same way with the attribute selector id the first everyone with this slide on the first in the name checked plus point slides and the h3 tag of course now i'm setting back the opacity to one transform translate y back to zero and transition all 0.5 seconds 5 seconds that's actually all and now let's see how it looks like reload now you see it has a really nice effect when we change the slides this is all about our full screen slider i hope you liked it and you see that you don't always need javascript to create something like a slider if it's much easier to do it with a CSS, it's actually not that much code. And I'll see you on the next list. The second project. In this project, we will create a little CSS terminal. And we are going to start right away with the console body. So I'm going to create a div tag console. And I'm going to nest within it a math bar and a screen element both divs so navbar then a screen within the navbar i'm going to add three buttons will be both uh, all three will be divs so i'm going to say give them all a button class say a times three then each one gets a separate class So button underscore underscore and then going to say red and uh, this one I give orange and this one uh, green to set the colors later and within the screen I'm going to add uh, another div tag with the class first line and within the first line I'm going to add some text I say home pc double point and then tilde space hello world never span with the class cursor and this is actually all about our html so far now we are going to add some style so we start with the console element and i give the width of 500 pixels and a height of 300 pixels a background of a slightly not that dark black and position relative a margin to center it let's say from the top 100 pixels and then auto and then I want to add uh, border radius to the top and left and the top right. So we do it by border, top, left, radius. So 10 pixels, border, top, right, radius, 10 pixels. And this I'm going to open in the browser and reload it. And we see here our window. 
Now I'm going to add the nav bar so the top vertebrae buttons will be placed. I'm going to do that by nav bar and going to say position absolute top zero left zero width of 100 percent background i give it a light gray and a height of 25 pixels i say it again the same i give it a border top left radius 8 pixels because otherwise it will be a bit overlapping and you see a little bit of black uh, through it so I'm going to bore it top right radius of 8 pixels now I'm going to open it in the browser again let's reload here you see our mapper now I'm going to add the styles for our buttons so the button class each button will have a width and height of 10 pixels and the position will be absolute as well I'm going to say top 50% then transform translate y minus 50% to center it perfectly in the middle and from the left I just want 10 pixels then I'm going to say border radius 100% let's open the browser to see how it looks like and now we don't see it yet because I didn't give it any color so let's add quickly a color by selecting the button red and saying background red or let's see if we use fire brick now open and we see the first button now I'm going to add the orange one setting the background to orange and I'm going to say left 28 pixels let's open the browser and see what it looks like and I'm going to see here yeah, this looks good now the last button button green background green and left 46 pixels let's open that looks good so we have all the buttons now I'm going to add the screen or let's say style the screen so the screen well first of all I have to push the text down so say say position relative top say 30 pixels let's see first if that is looking all right yeah then left 10 pixels that should be fine now I'm giving the text a little bit style so I'm going to add the, I'll start the first line give it a color white so you see the text a little bit better all right so now i'm going to add the plank effect so we also need a little bit of animation at least so i'm going to select our cursor 
and I'm going to say border right one pixel solid and white. See if you see it here. Yeah, here is the cursor. Now a little bit of march into the left. See if we have pixels. Yeah, hey, looks good. Now I'm going to create uh, keyframes for the animations. And I'm calling it blink. I say zero percent. I'm going to say border color transparent. One hundred percent border color. Wait. Now I'm going to add this to our cursor. So I say animation, blink. I'm going to say 0.75 seconds should be all right. I'm saying infinite and linear. And open the browser and see what it looks like. And looks good. That's how we create a little CSS terminal. Now we could add, of course, here other lines and add the cursor in the end and do a little bit fun JavaScript and stuff, but I'll leave that to you. That should be enough for now. So I'm going to see you soon. In our first how-to, I'm going to show you how to customize your select fields or your select drop-down input fields. And for that, I'm going to create first a div container. And with the container, I'm going to create another div and give it the name, or give it, give it the class dropdown. And if this drop in the, within this dropdown element, I'm giving the, the select field and some options. And I'm going to give it four options. I'm going to give the name of the select field again, job, and the ID jobs. And now I'm giving it some jobs, uh, adding to the options. Let's say here, web developer, maybe here's something like engineer, cashier, accountant. So these are our jobs. I am going to select the container first. And say here margin zero auto with um, 50% here. Yeah, like this, or yeah, let's just like it a little bit so we can see that better. And now I'm going to style or try to style the select field. Uh, the thing is, Select fields have some kind of problem, or some kind of you have know, some have some issues to style them because they have preset styles you can't just kind of get rid of, or and you will additionally have problems if you can get rid of them with cross browser support. So on Internet Explorer especially makes some problems there, but I'm going to show you some workarounds and some. Yeah, fixes that will help you to make this to solve these problems. So first of all, let's try to give it some style in general. Like for example, if you try to give your select field some padding, like make assume like two hundred pixels here, nothing will happen. So because of our preset default styles here, so what you can do here is adding something called appearance. Did I write it right? Appearance like this and set it to none. Nothing will happen here because this uh, you have to eat and you have to add some prefixes here for each browser compatibility. So I'm gonna eat here at here the WebKit appearance and set it to none too. And you see all the styles disappear except the border, actually. 
and for Firefox you're gonna add the must prefix appearance peer rips set to none too but you won't have to do that if you just gonna try here some stuff on in CodePen for example you just can add the auto prefixer then you don't need anything of this you just need appearance and the rest will CodePen do for you well like I said you will have some problems in Internet Explorer um, there is a workaround and you simply just select the select field and add a pseudo element ms expand here and set the display to none what this will do in Internet Explorer 10 and 11 it will hide the default error so this error you would have usually if you just read this here these errors here so I'm gonna put this back here and now we are going to style our select field so first of all I'm going to give it a padding I'm going to give it a padding of 8 pixels this is fine for me and I'm going to get rid of this border radius. I won't want any border radius in this case, so set it to zero. Looks also good to me. Now I want to add some after element. I want to add an arrow. So I can't do this with select after as you might think. That will have some problems so because of that I created a parent for our select field the drop down class here the div that has a drop down class and I'm gonna style the drop down instead the select field itself I'm gonna make display inline block because I don't want it to have the whole width actually here and I'm going to give the Drop down the display inline block two and um, that's actually all. Gonna add the drop down after element and what we don't forget set the position to relative here. All right. So first we need of course the content again and the content will be here not empty we will add here some icon and the standard font comes actually with some cool icons you can find on the website like toptal.com or some other websites too and you always find in something like the css code here so you're gonna just have to copy the css code and paste it into your content here and you see already here's this icon the little arrow and that arrow i want on top zero right zero and to align it like this of course you have to set the position to absolute mm, awesome and i'm going to increase the width of this whole select field a little bit so i'm gonna give it 165 pixels Exactly. Then I am going to say line height. I'm gonna change the line height to center that whole icon here. So 35 pixels is pretty much the center. Let's make it 38 a little bit more. Uh, 37. Let's leave it to 37. Then I give it a padding right. Uh, five pixels exactly around say eight yeah and we have our icon here we can try also some other icons here we'll let's see if we find something interesting here let's say we want like this here for example this uh, looks good let's take this code just copy and paste it in your code here uh, good now we have here this little error like with this 
like error looking to the right here, this create a damn thing. And this is how you actually style your yeah, your drop down or your, your select field, your select element. You can also change the border here if you want to. All kind of stuff. So if you have problems, like I said before, repeating, if you have problems with Internet Explorer to make your form elements display correctly, especially here you select fields, add always this lines here and it should, you should be fine and for all the other browsers you add appearance none or if you don't use an auto prefix or something when you compile your files then you just add like a prefix like moss or webkit and you're really fine to go so i hope to see you in the next how to lecture and i hope i could help you with that issue I'm going to add here the normalize and the auto prefixer. Then I'm going to create the HTML, which will be a div container and a div input group and another one. And within the input group, I'm going to add a label. This label will be for mail. So I'm going to say mail here. Then I'm going to create the input. And we'll, this will be a radio. And I give the ID of mail. Then I'm going to create another one and say here female, female, and the input again, the type of radio, and the ID of female. All right, this should be all. Now I'm going to create the CSS. First of all, I'm gonna take the container here and say mod zero auto to center it a little bit and give it a bit of, I don't know 300 pixels then uh, I might say also I want a little bit distance from the top all right now I'm going to create a input group selector and I'm going to say this block is automatically set with 100% and padding 12 pixels zero. So from the top and the bottom, it will give a little bit space. So now we are coming to the radio button itself. Maybe first. Now let's create first the radio button. So first of all, I'll say input, and I'm going to use this selector here and say radio. And then I'm going to say appearance none. Appearance, I should write it correct, of course. So the ready button is already actually gone, but now I am gonna bring it back by saying the same selector here and say before. First of all, we have to give it a content, then position absolute left zero say top zero bottom zero with 10 pixels and height 10 pixels background this color here so we see it already it appears on the top left corner of our screen but of course have to set the position of the parent relative 
All right, so this is now on the very left. And actually, let us do a little bit different here. I'm gonna put the radio button before the label actually. So let's just copy this here. So I don't have to worry about the lighting for now. I think I just deleted the label. Let's create quickly another label, mail, mail. And that's all right. Okay, good. Now I'm going to say that our label, so let's make our label maybe here. So label is margin left 12 pixels. Want to have a little bit distance between it. And except background this, I'm going to say here border one pixel solid the same color. Then I say border radius, 100%. Perfect. I have bottom and top to zero, left to zero, that is right. Now I'm going to change here the line height. You have to try a little bit. And of course I should also say display inline block. Let's make it a block level element actually, and then now say line height so pixels is a little bit too much. Let's say eight or better six. Six is good. Okay, margin left. Maybe a little bit more. Let's make 24. And now we have this, our little radio buttons already cut up. I forgot to put actually all our radio buttons in the form. So let's do this quickly. Just gonna copy all this here and put it in a form. This maybe a little bit more structure. All right. Okay. Now I have everything we can continue with. So I'm going to say input. Ah, damn it. Type radio and use here the after. But before I use the after, I want to say checked after. And the same thing, content, position, absolute, left, two pixels maybe, top two pixels, bottom I'll leave now, Let's see width eight, pixels height, eight pixels, background, same color, border, radius, 100%, right. Now I'm gonna click here and you see the radio button is there and it works. This is our little radio button. Of course, let's, let's make it actually a little bit bigger here. So it looks a little bit cooler. So I'm going to say in our before one with 50 maybe. Yeah, that's pretty big. And going to say here not, then I don't know, let's say 14. How does the, what does it look like here? Uh, that's a little bit too much. Let's say 12. 
Yeah, that's not a bad. 12, and let's say three, three. That's not a great, actually. This doesn't look that good. Mm, we can make four. That's too much, probably. Let's, make, let, let's leave it to two and just make the width a little bit smaller. And it fits. All right. Perfect. Now I'm going just to uh, save this quickly here. No, I don't want to. And click, click, and perfect. So this is how you create custom-made ready buttons.